Hello folks, welcome back to uh, part two of our, uh, our video series, if you will, on lock-free to wait-free simulation in Rust. Um, the idea here is to uh, take this paper that, was, uh, that someone sent to me a while back, and I think it's just really cool, on a practical wait-free simulation for lock-free data structures. That's basically a way to turn um, a lock-free data structure into a wait-free data structure. Um, I'm not going to rehash all of the all the definitions and, and what that all means and how we get there. Uh, all of that is covered in part one, which um, I will make sure that if you look at this video after the fact, there'll be a little pop-up like up here somewhere that you can click. Um, and if you're watching live, hopefully in chat, there'll be a video to um, the first uh, part video and you should go watch that. Like, I don't think it's likely um, that you will get much from this video if you uh, haven't watched part one. So go watch part one instead and you can come watch uh, the video on demand version of this afterwards. Um, I'll also just take a, a quick aside before we dive into the actual paper and the implementation uh, where we last left off to mention that I wrote a book. Um, I wrote uh, a book called Rust for Rustations. Uh, and it sort of is what, what the title tries to say. Basically, it is a book that um, tries to cover um, the Rust language and the ways to use it and the, the sort of idiomatic um, programming techniques and, and the mechanisms and how stuff works sort of under the hood, how things fit together, best practices, sort of everything that I've built up um, of sort of knowledge and experience with the language up through the years uh, in book form. And it's specifically written for those who already know Rust. So this is not a replacement for the Rust book, um, and not at all. This is specifically a book for those who already know Rust and want to sort of deepen that understanding um, make sure that you actually like understand what's really going on like under the hood or um, understand good like programming patterns, how code should fit together, what idiomatic Rust looks like, or if you just want more exposure to more parts of Rust, to more cool features of Rust. Um, it's available for like early access now. Ooh, wrong book. Um, for early access now, so you can um, buy the early access and then you also get all the chapters as they're released uh, and the final book at the end. Um, and you can also order the print book once it's actually released. Um, I'll leave the link in YouTube it's in the chat. All right, sweet. Now let's go over to the paper. All right, so uh, last time we went through mostly the construction of the sort of abstraction that we want to provide. Um, so the abstraction here is like, um, remember there's a sort of a translation from something that's lock-free to something that's wait-free, but only if the lock-free data structure is expressed in this normalized form. Uh, and so what we did last time was mostly try to capture what that normalized form is um, through the use of a trait. So specifically, we wrote this trait, um, where is it? This trait normalized lock free. Um, it has some associated types. Um, and then it has these two methods, generator and wrap up, where generator is stuff that happens before the critical section, the sort of commit point for the lock free algorithm. Uh, and it generates a list of compare and swap operations that are the actual commit points. And then a wrap up method that is that executes after uh, the commit point has happened and then tries to sort of complete the operation and give some, um, some final output of the computation. Um, and then what we did was we wrote this, uh, no, not the help queue, but this wait free simulator struct, which is generic over any type that implements the, the trait, which is basically the lock free data structure. Um, and then it does all of this, um, this sort of, uh, uh, logic around when you call the generator, when you call wrap up, how do multiple threads help each other out to make progress uh, and sort of deal with all the concurrency aspects of it. Um, and where we left off was basically the CAS execute method. Um, we only have like a very, very basic implementation of. Um, and then there's also the help queue, which is this like wait free queue of pending tasks or pending actions that 
threads might help each other perform. Um, and this wait-free queue, um, there's it it can't itself use the wait free simulation we're using because that would be a recursive dependency. Um, so instead, we're going to have to implement this wait free queue from scratch. Um, and luckily, the paper includes a, um, a sort of tailor made wait free queue implementation um, in its appendix towards the bottom that we're going to be implementing here. Um, I think just to sort of get back into things um, before we implement the wait free queue, uh, let's go ahead and finish up cast execute because that's sort of where we were last time. Um, before we do, let's sort of go uh, take sort of one step up just to see what the the higher level sort of call graph looks like here. Um, so we have the um, this is all in the wait free simulator struct. Um, we have a run method that takes an operation that some thread wants to execute and re returns a, an output for that operation. And if you remember, this was something that uh, made us a little bit sad, right? That the, in technically there's like one output type for each input type, and we can't easily express that the way it's currently set up. Um, there are ways for us to get around this, but I think for now, what we're gonna do is just say that both of these are enums. Um, and then like if you send in particular input, enum variant, uh, you should expect the output enum variant is the corresponding one. Um, we can try to find ways to enforce that with the type system later on, uh, but for now, let's leave it the way it was. Um, and you'll remember that in run, the sort of algorithm we're following, right, is that um, first, we're gonna try to help another thread if another thread needs help. Um, then we're gonna try this like fast path of the lock-free algorithm, which is basically, we're gonna assume that there's not that much contention. We're gonna just run the lock-free algorithm start to finish. And then we're gonna look for sort of signs of, um, of contention. And that's what this contention measure struct is for, uh, where we run the generator. Um, and if we detect that there's a bunch of contention by virtue of, for example, compare and swap operations failing, uh, then we switch to using the slow path. Um, then we do the cast execute step on the, the compare and swap operations generator generated. If we detect contention, contention there, we switch to the slow path. Um, and then we do the wrap up. And if it completes, we're done. Otherwise, um, we either do the slow path. If there was contention, you'll see a pattern here. Um, otherwise, we'll sort of go around again. So the idea is that first help in case there is someone who needs help, um, then do the fast path a couple of times. And then if we detect contention or if the fast path doesn't succeed in a certain number, number of tries, which is equivalent to saying there's probably contention, uh, then we switch to the slow path. And the slow path, if you remember, is um, we sort of enqueue this encoding of what operation we want to execute. Uh, so that's this operation record, um, which we stick in an operation operation record box because we need to be able to do um, RCU on it. Like we need to atomically replace this operation as we execute. Um, we enqueue the help operation, and then we keep looking at um, whether our operation has completed. And if it has, we return. Otherwise, we keep helping. So the idea is that the slow path is stick my my operation on the queue and then just help everything that's in the queue until my thing completes. And that's how we sort of guarantee that over time, as long as some threads execute, all threads uh, make progress. Um, and then if we look at this, this sort of helping method, which is the core of what makes this algorithm wait free rather than lock free. Remember the, the basketball analogy from uh, from the previous stream. Help first just looks at the front of the queue, the front of the help queue, and if there's something there, it tries to help it. And the actual helping, if you recall, is um, look at what the current state of the operational record is. If it's completed, then we just remove it from the help queue. Um, if it's in a precast state, right? If it if it hasn't executed any of the compare and swaps yet, then we execute the compare and swaps, and then we try to do um, basically RCU, right? So we we read the current um, operation record, we modify our local copy of that operational record, and then we try to atomically swap back in the updated version. Um, 
And even if we fail, that just indicates that some other thread helped instead. And so progress is still made, is sort of the general idea here. And so this is really just a, every operational record is really a state machine of trying to move the operational record through multiple different stages of execution, where, where each stage is the computation made it a little bit farther than last time. Um, and, and it does this by read, copy, update, and then atomically write back uh, using a compare and swap. And so each of these help operations is really just calling into the under, underlying algorithm um, repeatedly, right? So remember, the generator can be called concurrently from multiple threads. Uh, cast execute can be called concurrently from multiple threads. Um, and wrap up can also be called um, concurrently from multiple threads. And the idea is that overall, as even if lots of threads are trying to help a single operation, you'll still make progress over time. Um, yeah, so this is that compare exchange where we take the our RCU copy and actually write it back or try to write it back into the operation record box. Um, great. So all of that sort of depends on this machinery of the generator, which is dictated by the algorithm, the wrap up, which is dictated by the algorithm, and the cast execute operation, which is dictated by the, um, the implementation provided by the paper, right? So cast execute um, is really, it takes a, a um, list of command and swap operations, and then it's gonna execute each one in turn until it finds one that fails. And if one fails, it's gonna return the index of the one that failed, because subsequently we need to make sure that we execute from there on, is the basic idea. Um, so if we go back to the paper, uh, what does this say? Figure five is what we want. Let's see if we can find figure five. It's probably further up, is my guess, actually. I should have written the page number. That was silly of me. Uh, figure five, the execute CASIS method. Um, so if you remember the CASIS, so um, if we backtrack a little bit, right, the uh, normalized lock-free trait has an associated type called CASIS or CASs is really, this really should be CASs, but Russ doesn't like that as a convention. Well, we might try to find a better name here, like CAS list maybe. Um, but the idea is that the, implement, the implementer of the trait can choose the representation of the, the list of CAS operations to execute. And the reason we wanted to do that is because most lock-free algorithms will just have a single cast. And so we don't want to enforce that it's like a vector or something, but some operations might actually want to have multiple casts uh, that need to be executed. And so we want to support that case, uh, again, without making that be a cost uh, for any algorithm that doesn't need more than one. Um, in addition, the uh, casts is also passed to the, uh, where is it? further up here. I really need to reorganize this file. Um, to the wrap-up method, which also receives the CASs. So the CASs are sort of a way for the generator to both convey which CASs have to be executed, but also as a way to communicate to the wrap-up method any additional meta information. So in some sense, like, this shouldn't really be called CASs. It should sort of be called, like, generator output. Um, and it just so happens that we require that the generator output type um, is something that we can index into in order to get out the cast descriptors. Um, currently, we did this with index. Um, There's like a question of whether that's actually a good idea, um, but we can figure that out later on. I think what we might want here is actually just to call this... Um, Actually, no, I think what we want here is called this generator or um, what's a good word for this? Like this is the, it's sort of the commit meta, right? Like this is the information that the generator 
produces that informs how to commit and what information to convey to wrap up. Um, so maybe it's maybe it's like commit sequence commit doesn't have to be a sequence um, commit state maybe really just is commit state That seems like at least a less confusing name than cases slash cases. Um, so we get this uh, this commit state. Descriptor is also pretty good. Staged is not bad. Um, actually, commit descriptor isn't bad. Commit descriptor is good. Like that. Um, so for the cast, I mean, they call it cast list. Uh, what we've really done here is that the commit descriptor is a type that has to implement cast descriptors, uh, which is part of what makes it a list. But the commit descriptor itself, we don't actually require to be a list. Um, and but but this trait bound requires that it's indexable and can give its length, um, which gets us pretty far. Um, so in that case, um, it says iterate through the length of the list, right? Get out the ith element. Do we ever need? I guess we need i. And we need each individual element. So maybe all we need here is really iterator. Like maybe the length isn't important. Right, like I'm thinking here, we iterate over it and we do need to get, like we, we only use the I for this I here. I wonder what this I here is even used for, right? Like, why is that I returned? Where does it go? The failed index goes into failed cast index. And where is failed cast index even used? Um, in fact, we don't even, where's our run method? So, that should be in help, which does this. That's the outcome, which we stick in post casts. And what do we use the outcome for? The outcome goes into wrap up. Does it go anywhere else? Seems like it only goes to wrap up. Wrap up gets the output of execute casts. So what does wrap up even do? Post casts. All right, so let's look at post casts, which is down here. I want to see what it does with the record with the failed index. It seems like it doesn't do anything with that failed cast index, which is kind of interesting. Like maybe it's not even important which one it is. I guess maybe, okay, so let's imagine that we have a lock-free algorithm that does two casts to commit. Maybe the wrap-up method needs to know which one failed in order to know like what kind of recovery it has to do. So it needs to know like the, the index um, that might be the case, 
but it sort of feels like it shouldn't necessarily have to be an index. But I guess let's let's stick with index for now. Um, I think then what we actually want here is that we don't care that it's indexable. I think all we care about is that it implements uh, I think all we care about is that it implements like into iterator. It's a little awkward, right? Because we want uh, we want a reference to the commit descriptor to implement iterator, um, and I think you can technically do that. Uh, like, I think you can add a where bound here. But I think what we will actually want to do here is this. And then I think we can say here where commit descriptor, uh, where self commit descriptor um, implement, where not even that, but where for any reference that implements uh, into iterator where the item is uh, that's real ugly, but self cast right? Like that's sort of what we want to say. But I kind of don't want to express it that way. I think actually what we're going to do is not even include it there. And instead, say um, that we're going to stick that on the impl block down here, uh, where oh yeah, the the for syntax. So this is a uh, higher higher kind of lifetime bounds. So basically I'm saying for any lifetime tick A, I want a reference with tick A of the of a commit descriptor to implement into iterator item of that same lifetime tick A um, reference to a cast. Um, higher rank trait bounds, yeah. And yeah, I think that's good because I don't think we need the length, right? Like I think all we need here is for I and Cass in uh, descriptors dot into iter dot enumerate, right? And now this will be a Cass that we can execute. That looks nicer, right? This also gives us a couple of things, like it, it might eliminate a um, bounce check in the generated code. Um, it also means that um, if people use an option, for example, it worked pretty nicely. I forget it's, if tuples, no, probably not. It'd be nice if a one tuple implemented into iterator of its inner type. That feels like a cool implementation to add. Um, yeah, I like this. That looks nice because now we're no longer requiring the implementer to like implement the in the uh, index trait, which is a little weird anyway. Like it, it feels like all it should require is iterator anyway. So I think this is fine. All right, um, so back to this. So we get the CAS and then we look at the state of the CAS. Right, so here's one thing that we're currently missing, which is currently we just say that a um, that the CAS type has to be a CAS descriptor. And the only thing CAS descriptor has to do is execute. Um, but in reality, what should actually be in a CAS is it also needs to have state, it needs to be able to do like clear bit. 
So it looks like there's actually some more stuff that goes in the cast than just execute. So I wonder if cast is actually a type that we want to control. Like I think cap descriptor maybe should be a, um, a struct instead. Um, maybe backed by a type that implements, I guess, cast. Right, so here we can say that a cast descriptor should contain, I guess, uh, a state, which we don't know what type is gonna have yet. Uh, whatever this like bit stuff is. Cast state field. Write state field modified bit set. Okay, so there's gonna be some like bit set in here too which we don't know what is yet. And it looks like um, there's like a, an enum of uh, cast state, which is gonna be either success or failure or pending, right? So there's success, there's failure, there's pending and that looks like all of them. Okay, so state is gonna be a cast state. Um, and it looks like we have to be able to do a compare and swap on the state field. So what we're gonna do here is actually a, I guess, wrapper u8, and then we're gonna have this be a, um, oh, it's a little awkward. Uh, I was thinking this should be like an atomic U8. Um, atomic U8. Um, but that's a, it's a little awkward because we want to sort of say that this is really a cast state. Um, but I think it's going to have to be an atomic U8. Because otherwise we can't do like a compare and swap on it, for example. But this repr u8 means that we should be able to just trivially cast between a u8 and a cast state. Um, and the bit set, this is like clear bit and modified bit set. Oh, modified bit set, I see. So we need to figure out what this like modified bit is. Um, there are no atomic enums, no. Um, I guess let's maybe actually read this text. Um, the execute cath cast method receives as its input a list of cast descriptors to be executed. Each cast descriptor is also associated with a state field, which describes the execution state of this cast. Succeeded, failed, or still pending. Great, so we got those three. A controlled execution of these critical casts requires care to ensure that each cast is executed exactly once, the success of the cast gets published even if one of the threads stop responding, and an ABA problem is not created by letting several threads execute the sensitive cast instead of the single thread that was supposed to execute it in the original lock-free algorithm. The ABA problem is introduced because a thread may be inactive for a while and then successfully execute, execute a cast that had been executed before if after its execution, the target address was restored back to its old value. I see. Okay, so what they're trying to solve for here is, uh, so we, we talked about the ABA problem on the previous stream, but the idea is that the, the, the compare and swap is really an operation that's trying to like do a compare and swap of some other value in the system, right? Like it's trying to swap, uh, let's say, a something that currently has the value A um, to something that has the value B, right? And imagine that we have all these threads trying to help and one of those threads just like goes to sleep for a long time. And eventually that operation succeeds, like A does get changed to B, the operation succeeds, and the whole rest of the program keeps executing. And then at some point, for some because of some other operation, that B gets turned back into an A again. And now that, um, that helping thread that was just asleep comes back and it 
sort of resumes trying to redo that old CAS, those trying to change A to B. And, and normally that would have failed because the value had changed from beyond A, but since it's just looking at the value, it's gonna now see, oh, the value is A, so I'm gonna change it to B again, even though that's the wrong thing to do. Um, and so what they're trying to get at is Let's see. Ideally, we would like have liked to ink. Uh, we would have liked to execute three instructions atomically. Read the state, attempt the cast if state is pending, and update the cast state. Unfortunately, since these three instructions work on two different locations, the cast's target address and the descriptor's state field, we cannot run this atomically without using a heavy mutual exclusion machinery that foils weight freedom and is also costly. Um, to solve this atomicity problem, we introduce both a versioning mechanism to the fields being cast and an additional bit named modification bit to each cast field. In a practical implementation, the modified bit is on the same memory word as the version number. The modified bit will signify that a successful cast has been executed by a helping thread, but possibly not yet reported. So when a cast is executed in the slow path, a successful execution will put the new value together with the modified bit set. As a result, further attempts to modify this field must fail since the expected value of any cast never has this bit set. I see. So the idea is that we're going to have a modified bit that is like in the value that gets cast that we're going to turn that's always going to be off when you do the cast. When a field has the modified bit set, it can only be modified, uh, and this prevents the ABA because um, if the value is, uh, let's see, so the cast is gonna try to modify A to B, but it's only gonna be allowed to do that if the modified bit is unset. Mm, there's something weird here. I think this is gonna come back to, um, the, I think what we're missing here is the versioning, which they talked about a little bit earlier. I think we're going to end up having to implement a way to do um, versioning and the modified bit here. Mm. The modified bit will signify that a successful cast has been executed by a helping thread, but possibly not yet reported. So when a cast is executed in a slow path, a successful execution will put the new value together with a modified bit set. As a result, further attempts to modify this field must fail since the expected value of any cast never has its bit set. When a field has the modified bit set, it can only be modified by a special cast primitive designed to clear the modified bit. This cast, which we refer to as clear bit cast, is the only cast that is executed without incrementing the version number. Yeah, so there's actually a combination here of a version number and a modified bit. Mmm... Yeah, it only clears the modified bit and nothing more. Interesting. Okay, so what we really need here is we need to implement the versioning. That's a little awkward. So to recap the versioning, um, let me go back up here to find where they talk about that. Um, Finally, we so this is uh, for the requirements for how to do the generation. We require that the casses that the generator method outputs be for fields that employ versioning. That is, a counter is associated with the field to avoid the ABA problem. The version number in the expected value field of a cast that the generator method outputs cannot be greater than the version number currently stored in the target address. The version number in the expected value field of a cast that the generator method outputs cannot be greater than the value already stored in the target address. Right, so every cast has to end up incrementing the version number. This requirement guarantees that if the target address is modified after the generator method is complete, then the cast will fail. Okay, so we're going to have to do a little bit of drawing here, I think, to explain what's going on. Um, so let's see here. Um, the basic idea is 
So I think we drew um, a little bit about the ABA problem last time, but essentially, ugh, this cable is in the way. Go away, cable. Um, essentially, what we have is, let's say the sum place in memory over here. This is foo. Foo is um, some address in memory, currently has the value A, right? And now imagine we have some thread that wants to do a cas. Um, they want to cas foo from A to B, right? Um, and let's say that we have multiple threads that are all trying to do this. So we have T1 is trying to do this and T2 is also trying to do this. Cas of foo from A to B. Um, and now imagine that T, apparently my writing is really bad. Um, let's say that this uh, goes to sleep, uh, but this one succeeds. So now this is no longer A, this is now B. Um, and then some T3 comes along. This is what I uh, described earlier, right? Um, it tries to change foo from B to A. Um, it ends up succeeding. So this now gets changed to A. Uh, this T2 then now resumes uh, and now executes that operation and it succeeds. So this becomes B again, even though these two were sort of supposed to be a single operation and only be applied once. Um, but we ended we ended up executing like one, two, one, when really we should have just done one, two, right? So because this this operation here succeeded, even though it was a, an earlier update that has already happened. Um, and so the the versioning that we're going to be introducing here is basically to say, or what, what the paper is asking us to do is to instead say that any value that you want to be casable um, needs to not just be um, like, you need to have versioning embedded in the value that gets cast. Um, so if this is A, it actually needs to be like A zero. And then the way the casts will look, um, let's see if I can, f actually, let's do this over here. Um, so with versioning, it's gonna look like foo is gonna be a box over here and it's gonna have the value A zero. Um, and then let's, let's walk through what happens with the same thing. All right, so we have T1 and T2 both trying to help each other. Um, this is a cas of foo from A zero to uh, B1, um, and this is the same, right? It's the exact same operation. Um, this goes to sleep, this completes. So this is now, like foo is now gonna be um, B1. And notice that this this cas incremented the version number, right? The, the second thing here is the version number. Um, and now T3 comes along and it wants to do a cas of foo from uh, B1 to A2, right? And you'll notice the difference here, right? Is that now that the new value here is no longer the same as the old value here because the version is being incremented again. So even if this now succeeds and then T2 runs, the value that's in here is A2. And so the, uh, if we go back here, T2, the cas of foo from A0, zero, zero oh, that writing was bad, to uh, B1 will now fail because A0, right? Remember, compare and swap is if this first argument is equal to the current value, then and only then update. Well, this value, which is the current value, is not equal to, uh, or this, or if you prefer math, this, um, they're not equal and therefore the compare and swap will fail. So versioning sort of solves that ABA problem. 
of course, the, the, the challenge with ABA here or the challenge with, with versioning is that now the, the value that you have to compare and swap is no longer like just a value. Um, let's take the example here of uh, the, this type that we originally wanted to ca uh, cast being a pointer, right? So we're using atomic pointer. Well, atomic pointer only holds a thing that's of pointer size. Right? So where would the version number go? Where does this go? Right? Because the A, the value A fills the pointer value. So where does the, the version number go? We can't just make it a tuple because then we couldn't do a compare and swap on it on, in the first place. Um, so there are a couple of ways to deal with this. Uh, one is by doing bit fiddling. So one observation you can make is that a pointer is something like 0x on, on 64-bit, that is. And then it's usually like, I forget exactly what the, I think generally the high bits are ones. And then it's like 2, 4, B, A, C, 0, 1, 0, 0, or whatever, right? some address, right? Um, but if you know that the high bits are always ones, then you can sort of like leech off some of the high bits. Or if you know that the low bits are always zero, because for example, the value needs to be aligned, then you can use, you can like stick some secret bits in here, right? So we can take the pointer that we were supposed to use and just here like stick in like a version number of let's say one zero or something, right? Like, or I guess zero two, if we wanted to store uh, a two here where this is a, right? What I what I wrote out here was the, the value of the a pointer, then a comma two, so a versioned as two would be the same thing for all the lead digits, but then would be zero two at the end instead. And then we just need to remember to like zero out the low bits before we actually try to dereference in the value ever. Um, this works. Um, in fact, there are a decent number of um, libraries and tools and programs that, that do this kind of magic. Um, there are a couple of downsides to it. So the first one is that you are relying on particular features of the address space. Um, so in particular, you're, if you use the high bits, then you're assuming that the um, the high bits are, can all be set to zero or one to recover the original pointer, right? Like imagine that you're running on like an ARM platform or something where the high bits are actually like A, C, B, A, two, four or whatever, right? Then if you tried to like store your version number up here and then just like flip them all back to, to ones, to, to all Fs, in order to recover the original pointer, that wouldn't be the original pointer anymore because the original pointer started with like this value instead. And so that wouldn't work. Um, so if you use the high bits, it often ends up being like architecture dependent. Um, if you use the low bits, you can always say that like, we require your target addresses to be like 64 byte aligned or something to say, basically to dictate how many, um, how many, bits at the end are going to be zeros. Um, but the problem is that you don't end up with too many bits to spare, right? Like, let's say um, we require that someone use... Mm, let's say that we require that their values are 256 byte aligned. So anything that they point to has to start at a, uh, an address that's aligned to 256 bytes, um, which basically means that the, uh, the last eight bits of the address have to be zero. Well, all we then have to store the version number is, is eight bits, right? Which is just 256, which means that you can't have more than 256 versions, right? or you wrap around. So the moment, like at some point you do like, 
if, if we imagine continuing the sequence, right, eventually you get to like x comma 255. And at this point, you've set all the bits you can. So your only option, if someone modifies to, to y, is going to be y comma 0. But now you're exposing yourself to the ABA problem again. Because imagine, I mean, you're making it less likely, but imagine that like T2, like let's imagine someone changed X to A, right? At zero, because it wrapped around. So it's really 256, but it has to be zero because we only have so many bits. Um, then now T2 might end up succeeding in this operation, even though lots of operations have happened because we wrapped around. Uh, so you really kind of need the version number space to be large enough that you're not going to wrap. Otherwise, you, you reintroduce the ABA problem. Um, the, the, if you use the high bits, usually you have more bits to play with. And so you're less likely to wrap around. But even then, like you, like, you need a decent number of bits before you can actually... Uh, reliably assume that you won't wrap around like with 64 bits you're just not gonna wrap around like it's like the the total lifetime of the universe or something like you're just not gonna wrap around um but if you only have 10 bits like that's not realistically um you, you it's not gonna you're not gonna get there okay so then what do we do if we don't want to do this bit twiddling uh so there are a couple of options uh for example here, here's another option. If you have access to Atomic U128 and you're on a 64-bit platform, then voila, your problem is solved. You just have your Atomic Pointer be an Atomic U128 where the left 64, and it doesn't really matter whether it's left or right, this is the pointer, and the right 64 this is the version. Ta-da! Okay, great. Now, let's go and see whether we can actually get um, Atomic U128. There's no Atomic U128 here. Right? Like, what's in here? If we look down. Yeah, it only goes to 64. Now, I'm fairly sure that there is intrinsics if we go to intrinsics um atomic exchange weak uh i'm pretty sure that this on like x86-64 on newer CPUs, I think you can do, why does this not? I guess it's because of the intrinsics. Um, let's go ahead and look at, maybe C++ specs will tell us. Uh, yeah, a C++ reference x, Change. Uh, that's not very helpful. Atomic exchange. Uh, it doesn't actually say which types. Um, well, it doesn't really matter. We're not going to start using intrinsics anyway. But like, clearly in the standard Rust library, we don't have access to an atomic 128-bit value. I think some CPUs support it. Uh, if you have that, that's great. You can just go with that. But for, for all of us uh, sim simpletons who only have 64-bit processors that can do 64-bit operations atomically, what do we do? Well, there's a little trick we can play, which is the following. Um, so what we're going to do is we're still going to have foo. And you're not going to like this, but it's sort of the a forced reality. 
Now, instead of saying a, which is what we really want to say, what we're going to do is we're going to make foo be a pointer. And it's going to be a pointer to a new object. And that on the heap, we're going to heap allocate an object. And we're going to say that it's going to have a value, which is going to be a, and it's going to have a version, which is going to be zero. Okay, and then what we're going to do is the compare and swap is going to swap this pointer for a pointer to a newly allocated object. This is going to be a value of b and a version of 1. That's a b right there. So the swap is going to be to this pointer. Ew, the heap, yeah, I know, right? And then it's gonna be another heap object. I'm just gonna use V for both of these because at this point you know what they mean, A and two. And now the reason this works is because let's do a compare and swap, right? To use this pointer instead, right? And now T2, Right, so let's see. Let's say this is zero x one. This is zero x two. This is zero x three. I mean, that's not actually what their pointers are going to be, but let's say it is. Um, and remember our good old friend T two, who is doing the old cast. Well, its cast is going to be foo from zero x one to zero x two. Um, but when we're in this state. Right, which is where it ends up after this was like T1 executing, this was T3 executing. If T2 comes along down here, it's trying to compare and swap 0x1, but that's not the current value, right? These are not the same, and therefore the compare and swap fails, which is what we wanted. It doesn't happen because of a version number in the compare and swap thing, but it happens because of a version number in the, in the heap allocation. So you might wonder, well, like, okay, John, uh, why can't the ABA problem happen now? Uh, and you're right, uh, it totally can. Um, so the trick here is to make sure, um, to basically make use of the, um, the way that we do garbage collection. So the idea here is that in order for T2 to be able to name this value, it must still have a reference. To this value. Therefore, this value cannot have been deallocated. It must still be allocated, otherwise T2 would never reference to it. Okay, so when this is allocated, it cannot have the same address as this, because this one is still allocated. It hasn't been freed yet. Therefore, the two addresses must be different. Therefore, the compare and swap must fail. Therefore, you're not subject to ABA. Now, later on, when T2 no longer holds a reference to uh, the original, like A0, right? Then A0 is deallocated and that address can be used again. But that's okay because there's no longer anyone who has that address and is trying to do a compare and swap because if they did, we wouldn't deallocate A0. So this works. The big downside, of course, is we have to do an extra allocation for any compare and swap value. Um, and we have to do this like, I mean, we're going to have to deal with memory reclamation at some point. And that also now has to sort of feed down into the compare and swap operations. But that's sort of where we get to. What's the point of having a version? Um, so that's another good question. Do we even need the versioning at this point? Or is the versioning sort of embedded in the, the fact that we're doing allocations? Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, we might actually not need the version. Uh, why would we not need the version? I think we still need the version to do, because we can do um, a sort of, we can do a proactive check for whether the cast is going to fail. 
um, if we store the version. But you're right, we probably don't need the version, but it's also not very costly for us to keep the version at this point. Um, uh, does that mean you need ref counting? Um, no, not necessarily. We could reference count these, um, but that wasn't my plan. Um, actually, maybe these are a good candidate for reference counting. Uh, is that true? No, this is going to be using the same memory reclamation scheme that we end up using for the rest of the data structure, which is um, probably going to be hazard pointers, which I haven't talked too much about. We'll talk about those in a, a separate stream where we implement hazard pointers. But um, the reason you don't want to use reference counting here, and I talked a little bit about this in the previous video, is that um, with reference counting, you still have a race condition between when you read the value, the, when you read the pointer to the reference counted value out of the atomic and when you try to increment the reference count for the copy you just got. Um, there's a race condition there and hazard pointers deal with that race condition. Uh, can you use an arena allocator? Yeah, I mean, you can use whatever allocator you want here um, and it should work just fine. Um, I don't know if you really need an arena allocator here, but it might be reasonable to associate an arena allocator with the whole data structure, especially because all of these allocations are uh, fixed size. Um, virtually all modern x86-64 processors support 16 byte compare and exchange. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Uh, let's add it to the Rust standard library. Um, this is all general to the simulation, but specific to the thing running under it. So you could also have a data structure which uses the pointer manipulated version or whatever. Yeah, I'm imagining that we could, um, we could totally make this generic. Uh, so that if someone wanted to do the bit fiddling, they could. At the same time, I kind of don't want to do that because People are going to get it wrong. They're not going to keep into account the fact that you will still potentially encounter the ABA problem. I would rather just give a correct solution and then have that be a little bit less efficient for now. And then what we could do is always do the, um, like swap out the implementation behind the scenes when we get something like a uh, 16 byte or 128 bit um, compare and swap. Um, and one additional benefit actually of doing the scheme this way is, let's say that we're willing to bite the bullet and just do it this way. Well, now we have a great place to stuff other stuff. Like for example, this modified bit. Previously, we had to figure out like, how do we stuff that into the pointer and stuff? Well, now we can just have a bool right here in the struct. This is a struct, we're just heap allocating it. So now we can add all this like additional information that we want just straight in that cast descriptor, which is pretty nice. Sweet. Okay, so now that we have an idea of, of what this scheme is going to look like, let's go back to the code. Um, so if we think about this now for a second, the commit descriptor is going to be a list of CASs. Um, and interesting, interesting, interesting. So rather than have this state be an atomic U8. Mm, maybe we do still want that. But I'm thinking we basically end up doing like RCU here again of like, we're gonna have a, um, okay, we're still gonna have a cast descriptor. It's like a weird problem here where we sort of want we want the user's data structure to wrap a data structure of our type. Uh, mm -mm -mm -mm. Right, so we're gonna require that the thing that the user does a CAS against, the value that they do a CAS against, has to embed the version and stuff, right? So if we go back to um, this for a bit, we require that the casts of the generator method outputs be four fields that employ versioning. Right, so this, the cast descriptor
Mm, trying to figure out what the right way to model this is. So each descriptor they produce is going to be, I guess this, this sort of has to be a trait. It's going to be a little bit awkward. Uh, I think you'll see why in a second. Um, but basically, it's, that's going to be a type that they provide. Um, but I sort of don't want it to be something they provide. I, cause, okay, let me, let me try to articulate my thoughts here. What I want is for the user to not have to think about this. I want them to be able to just think in terms of their values. Right, like the, the values that their data structure is going to use rather than have to think about this like versioning and additional bits and stuff, right? Um, so I sort of want their commit descriptors to be of a type that I control that does this like heap wrapping and stuff and that they can just express it in terms of what value they end up replacing out. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is say that they have to provide something that implements cast descriptor. Um, and our cast descriptor is really just going to be a um, an atomic pointer to also a type that we control, which is going to be a cast descriptor. I guess this is going to be a cast descriptor box to follow the the same nomenclature, the same terminology that we used for um, the operational records earlier, right? So this is going to hold an atomic pointer to a cast descriptor of T. Um, and a cast descriptor of T, sure, let's have it still be cast, uh, is going to contain the state. It's going to contain the version. Um, and I think we want the version to specifically be a U64. We don't want it to be U32, even on a 32-bit platform, because wrapping around would still be really bad. Um, and then we're probably going to end up with this like modified bit, right? And my guess is that these may have to be atomic as well, and I'll get into why that is in a second. Um, And then what we'll say is we're also going to store, I'm like, th I'm trying to think ahead here, right? So what do they have to be able to do uh, with the CAS? I think their CAS, hmm. It's almost like the cast just has to tell us what the new value is. Like they're not actually gonna do the cast. We're gonna do the cast by swapping out this like box instead. Uh, comment in the paper, it should all fit in a word. I don't think it said that, did it? Uh, where is, I'm just trying to find the, to the field being cast, name modification bit to each cast field. It's on the same memory, oh, same memory word as the version number. I don't think that's important. That's more of an optimization that they did. Um, Uh, the reason I want the box type is because uh, I don't want to expose the fact that we're using an atomic pointer. That's not important to the consumer. Um, but I'm trying to think ahead here of like the the implementing algorithm might also want additional, like you could totally imagine that they also have some additional bookkeeping they want to like stick in this descriptor. So I almost sort of want to say that like there's a, there's like a meta, which is T meta, so that they have a way to stick additional information in here, 
right? Um, but then there also has to be what is the actual cast going to be? Um, Like I think what's actually gonna happen is we're gonna even, okay, so imagine that the user actually just wants to do a compare and swap of like a Boolean. There's like, there's something, something's fuzzing in my head here of like, something is not quite right. Let me, let me look at the actual implementation they give. So, they have to be able to get the state separately, clear the bits separately. That's all fine. And I sort of want to see what the execute cas is. Like the execute cas is the thing that has to take into account the versioning. So it's almost like the execute cast that they do has to be over this type itself. It would actually help to see how a given data structure uses this. Um, Actually, let's go and look at the. Uh, let's go and look at what the real implementation does. So, um, yeah. So as I mentioned, I managed to reach out to the original author, uh, infrastructure, um, to get the original source code, and let's see what we get here. Is there a diff between? This is one thing you'll see with like research code bases is that there's a lot of just copies of files for various iterations of the same thing. Um, okay, so they have for um, a cast descriptor, they just have it be a trait. That's interesting. That just does execute cast modify. Okay, so now I want to see an implementation of this trait. Uh, I cast desk. Um, that's fine. Oh, that's probably in like one of the implementations. So let's go ahead and look at, I guess, skip list or Fomichev doesn't really matter so fs cast desk holder dot suck oh this is um this is a linked list and the compare and swap successor compare and set. I see what's going on. I see what's going on. Okay. Let me try to find the right way to articulate this. Uh, so holder here is a reference to like the current node in a linked list or something. You see fr node here is like the, the actual type for any given node. And you see that basically all of these methods end up forwarding into the suck, so the, the next pointer, if you will, of some whatever this node type is. And you see it has all of these implementations. And you see compare and set here on that takes like old version, old ref, new ref, old mark, new mark, old flag, new flag. So a bunch of like uh, arguments to make, to, to differentiate which version essentially we're talking about, um, which makes me think that it's actually 
we're actually requiring that the, the data structure is going to use our provided type, the one that does the heap indirection, anywhere where it normally would use just a pointer type um, so that it gets to embed this versioning. So my guess is that if we go look at uh, fr node, uh, fr node, uh, yeah, so you see the successor, the next thing, has a versioned tripled mark reference. Uh -huh. And my guess is that's the, the heap um, the heap indirection thing. So version triple mark reference is a atomic reference to a reference quintet. And the reference quintet has the actual reference, a mark bit, a flag bit, a help bit, and a version. Yeah, so you see, this is the thing that gets stored on the heap. Um, they just allocate a new one. And what does the compare and swap look like for this? The compare and set is get the current value, check that all are the same, and then compare and set the, oh, current. I see, and then, Com then so it's basically doing RCU. It's doing RCU on um, on the type itself. Okay. So the the we're not actually when you want to do a compare and swap of one of these, you're not actually doing a compare and swap. You're or I mean you kind of are, but you're really doing a. Um, RCU of like you allocate a new of these heap objects and then you do a compare and swap between them, which is exactly what we did, explained in the diagram. Um, but this helps. Okay, so the question is how do we translate this into Rust? Sorry, actually, let me stop there and see, like we've, we've been talking a lot around this topic. Uh, let's do some Q&A about this to see that we all have like a shared understanding of roughly what's going on. And if we don't, which is pretty reasonable, uh, try to talk through what that is. Um, let's see. Surely more efficient to leak the versioning to the consumer. Um, so it shouldn't be because in general, like, I mean, it could be if they like happen to know that they will never go through more than say 256 iterations before they hit ABA, but in general, they just won't know and we will get it wrong. It seems better to just like provide a safe implementation. Um, yeah, um, this source code, I'm, I'm working with the author to find a good way to like publish it um, beyond just me showing it on stream. Uh, part of it is like, it has a bunch of other code that's not quite related. So it needs to be tidied up a little before it can be posted anywhere. My plan is basically to post this alongside uh, the code when I when I put that in like a GitHub repo. Um, all right, but, but let's, let's sort of look at whether, uh, whether the architecture we're sort of planning here sort of makes sense. Does the heap allocation make sense? Does it make sense why we need to have this extra indirection? Uh, and the sort of latest observation that really what we're gonna do is um, have, we're gonna implement basically a compare and swap for the user. Like this isn't gonna be a TCAS, this is just gonna be the value that they want to compare and swap. And then we're gonna do RCU on this atomic pointer by allocating new instances of this. Uh, why can't wrap up prevent future repeats of the CAS? Uh, can you say more about what you mean? Wrap up is called concurrently from multiple different threads and will be called regardless of whether a given CAS succeeded or failed. It's just always called at the end. Part of the challenge here, right, is that if the CAS fails, we may have to do a bunch of cleanup, which is what wrap up is for. Um, and if you have multiple compare and swaps, like I think, um, I don't know whether any of the data structures in the paper require this, but the reason they constructed it this way is because there are lock-free data structures that have multiple commit points. And so you have to deal with the fact that like the first cast succeeded, but the second cast failed. 
And then when people help, you need to like deal with that situation. And part of that might be in wrap up, you go, we're now in a weird state. We need to redo generation as well in order to make progress. Um, part of the reason I'm stopping for Q&A is because I don't believe that anyone, that no one has questions. Uh, so like, if you have a question, you should ask it because I'm pretty sure other people will have similar questions. Even if it's just, I don't know what's going on, like explain it again uh, and I, I will try. Um, the basic thought here is that uh, I don't think, in fact, I think we may not even need this. Um, the basic idea here is that we're not going to do compare and swaps directly on a user's type. Instead, we're going to require that the user is using our atomic type, basically. So, so really, this should be called like atomic. And we're going to require that the user is using our implementation of atomic. Um, I guess we could make this a trait, right? We could say um, versioned atomic, right? And we're gonna require, and this is sort of the way the Java code was going, right? We're gonna require that they implement uh, like clear bit and um, what were the other ones? Like modified bit and uh, version, um, and execute. Uh, and then we could implement versioned atomic for um, for atomic T, right? We could do that. And then we just require that the user uses some type that implements versioned atomic. And then they could choose to implement their own scheme. But I'm sort of like, is that better? I'm not entirely sure. Like it sort of feels like, when would you ever use a different implementation? I feel like you're likely to use one that's just wrong. Um, I mean, maybe it'd be nice for testing. It's a good question. Maybe we should go this way. If, if just because it's sort of easier to present this way. Um, Can you post the Rust so far to the playground? Uh, yes, I can. Share. Um, what if we take ownership of the user data and store it as a heap allocated? That's basically what we're doing here, right? is that we're telling the user, like if you want some atomic reference type, you have to use our atomic reference type so that we can add versioning and this modified bit and all the other bits, like stuff that we need. Um, and at that point, because we're controlling the wrapping structure, you can use any T. Like one benefit here is that you don't need to use one of the standard atomic types. Like. It doesn't have to be like one of the things that the, the CPU can do atomic operations on because we're basically going to do RCU for you. So it can be any T here. Um, one thing that's a little awkward is we're currently requiring that they use the same T, um, which is kind of silly. Uh, and that might be one reason why we want versioned atomic here is because I think maybe we want, maybe it'd be nice if the commit descriptors were actually like din versioned atomic. So that um, a data searcher could admit, could emit like, um, let's say that you want to do, you have like an atomic, I don't know, root pointer in a B tree, but you also have an atomic, like you want to, your commit operations are do a cast on the root pointer and do a cast on a value, right? Those aren't the same type, but we still want you to be able to express that those are your two commit points. And so I do think actually we do need this trait because we need this to be a uh, din atomic uh, versioned atomic. 
so that you can have different values for it. I think that's actually gonna be necessary. And at that point, this does need to be a trade. Um, and then if we, uh, I guess at this point, we need to look at infrastructure, ICAST desk, um, and then we basically just need these operations. Oops, um, which is going to be fn execute cast bool. And this is going to be execute. Let's take a ref self. Uh, modified bit set. Wait, this, why does clear bit return a bool? So this is going to take a self. Um, this has to return, I guess, a cast state. Um, and set state also has to be able to run atomically, I think. Right, and then we can provide sort of a, a standard implementation in the form of our, um, I guess cast descriptors may be a bad name here. This is really a cast by RCU. This may be a better name and it doesn't have to be public. And then we can implement versioned atomic for our atomic type where execute is gonna be um, well, I guess here we can actually look at what this one did, right? So actually, uh, yeah, so they, but they, there's like more information around this, which is what makes me hesitant that, that maybe we actually want to, maybe our wrapper doesn't even make sense in the first place. Uh, let's see. Yeah, because you see here, like execute cas is executing it specifically for a particular like, like it. This holds context as well, right? So maybe we actually maybe what we need to do is we're going to expect that the user uses our atomic type, and that they sort of. Oh, I see what's going on. The the cast descriptor they give us is something that wraps our atomic with additional information that that atomic might need in order to execute. So our atomic is going to implement, uh, I guess, um, it needs to implement all of these operations. Is that even true? Yeah, it has to implement, really what we're implementing is this like triple marked reference. And it, it has methods like compare and swap. So we're gonna say compare and I guess set is what they're using here. Um, and it takes expected, which I'm guessing is, a reference to a T and a new, which is going to be a T. It's like something weird here. Um, I don't know what this mark is. I'm getting that, guessing that's something we're going to get to 
later. Where does it actually check the version is what I want to know. So it checks all this like associated metadata, checks whether the reference is equal to the current one. But where does it actually, all right, all it has to do is increment the version. I see, so really without any additional information, this is just um, if, so this is self.0.load. Uh, and this is where we're gonna get into this business of the unsafe load again. Um, and then if this dot, I guess this should maybe be value or referent or something. If this old value equals expected, then like self dot zero dot store um, then we're going to replace the whole thing. This is the, the RCU part by RCU uh, with some updated stuff down here. Am I being silly? Ordering sec CST. Um, then return true. Otherwise, return false. And I guess I'm being kind of silly because we just replaced all these methods with ones with different names. Oh, I see. No, that's what I did. Um, right. So I actually think Atomic shouldn't implement this trait. Atomic should provide methods that the user then uses to implement versioned Atomic for their cast descriptors. So I'm, I'm talking a little, a little bit around this because I'm like grappling with it in my head too. Um, but I think what we want here is the user is going to implement versioned Atomic for, or maybe versioned CAS is a better name for this. They're going to implement versioned CAS for every cast descriptor they have, right? So remember, a cast descriptor isn't just an atomic. It's like a descriptor of what cast should you do, which includes the current value, the expected value, the, the expected value, the new value, and any like associated metadata that it might need to actually execute the cast. And ultimately, ultimately, we require that they implement versioned cast. That is, they have to provide these methods. Um, and the way they're going to do that is their cast descriptor will probably internally contain one of our provided atomic types and just call into its methods, um, which is what we provide down here. But atomic itself doesn't implement like cast descriptor, right? It just implements like a versioned cast. So like really, maybe this is like versioned cast descriptor, um, but really it's, well, versioned it's like a versioned cast it's like a pre-filled versioned cast or a uh no i think version cast is right this is a ready to execute compare and swap that is itself versioned. And what it's probably going to use internally is one of our atomic types, with, which provides you with the methods that you will need in order to implement versioned CAS. I think that's the way this sort of thing is going to go around. Um, OK, so in our case, um, what do we want this to provide? I guess we can continue to take inspiration here from the version triple mark reference from Java, because presumably this is all that you really need. Um, so you can obviously make a new one. That sounds like a pub of n new. Certainly seems like something that we need. 
Um, and a new, what does new take in this case? It takes an initial ref, which is a T. Um, we don't know what mark flag and help is. My guess is like this, and this is presumably why it's called a versioned triple mark reference, is because it has three of these additional meta information. So really it sounds like what we want here is our atomic should hold like T and M maybe, where M is like meta. That is not a part of the value but rather is something that's considered part of the current state and something that should be considered for whether the compare and swap should, should happen. So I think that's actually what we're going for here. This is a meta, which is M. And you can think of like, uh, these are conditions for doing the swap, which means that state probably shouldn't be in there actually. Um, is my guess. I don't think this talks about state at all, and it probably doesn't talk about the modified bit at all either. It just has version and meta, uh, and then this is the uh, value that will actually be cast. I think that's what we want. And then the user's cast descriptor is going to implement the modified bit and the um, and the state. But that's not something that we have to provide in our atomic type. Uh, and we probably here then are going to do something like acquire that m implements partial eek and probably also eek. Um, and then what we'll do is, right, so you see it has these like is marked flag and is help, which are really just accessors for these like three Booleans. But really what we're saying is you can say, you can include whatever uh, meta information you want. So maybe we have a method that's like, the, the equivalent for us is meta, which you take in itself and gives you an M back. And that's just self.meta. Um, and for a compare and set, it's like if this dot value is equals expected and uh, this dot meta equals, so this is going to also take a meta, not meet. Actually, yeah, so you see the compare and set takes in both the old meta and the new meta. So it takes in the expected the expected sort of value and the expected meta and it's a and it takes in a new and new meta and it checks that the current value matches the expected value and the current meta matches the expected meta and if that is the case then it stores the updated value Right, so it checks that the bits are all the same. It checks that the current value is still the same. I'm not quite sure why they're separated, because it can just be a tuple. Like, why does it need to be separated? Not entirely clear yet. It might be that we just make this T, and that's good enough. Um, and oh, I see. And then it's like, if the new values are equal to the old values, then we don't need to do the compare and set. So this is like if. Um, this dot, if I guess expected equals new and um, expected meta equals new meta, or to invert, if that's not the case, then we do actually have to do the store. Um, and that's gonna be not a store, but a compare and set. Uh, so we're gonna have we're gonna have to actually read out the current value so that we know what to like. There's like a race condition here, right? In the in the way that I wrote this so far, if if we have this be a store, 
right? We read out the current, um, the current state of the CAS, right? The current state of the thing in the heap, the meta descriptor. Um, and then we check it and then we just store the updated one. But while we're checking, someone else could go in and swap it out behind us. So we need to do make this be a compare and swap instead. Um, and we need to make sure that we only do the store if this is still the same, if the, the thing in the heap is still the same one. Uh, so we're gonna do that by doing this. So this is gonna be, I guess, this ref um, or pointer rather. Um, then we're gonna do compare and swap this pointer with the updated one. And this is like the RCU bit. And the version is gonna be, um, I guess this dot version plus one. Uh, meta is gonna be new meta and value is gonna be uh, new. Whew. Uh, why can't user directly just use our atomic and not necessarily have to implement version CAS? So the reason we want the user to implement version CAS, why they can't use atomic directly, is because there's additional information in a CAS descriptor, right? Like a, a CAS descriptor also includes the address of the thing to do the CAS on, what the expected value should be, what the new value should be. It's a descriptor of a CAS that you haven't run yet. So an atomic is really just a casable thing, right? Like a, in some sense, like atomic implements casable. Um, but what we want is something that implements version cast, like a thing that describes the cast that we haven't done yet. So the user's type is a cast descriptor that's going to ultimately invoke a cast on an atomic. So this is like a, it's like a version, a prepared version cast or something, right? But it's not actually the result of a cast. It's not, it's not like atomic here isn't a cast. It's a castable type. Uh, and that's why we need that intermediate layer, which is the actual descriptor. Um, does that make sense? Like why, why we need the distinction? And this is gonna be clearer with some documentation, right? But but I think once we actually write an implementation, you'll also see why this distinction makes sense, which is basically all the stuff that needs to go in a descriptor has to go somewhere and it, it can't go in Atomic itself. Um, instead of relying on the user to invoke methods of Atomic, would it be better to make them implement a function that returns an Atomic? Um, no, because if if this return if this trait had a function that returned an atomic, then we wouldn't know what arguments to invoke that atomic with. That's the problem, right? Again, an atomic is just something that is casable, and then the descriptor contains basically all the arguments. Um, and because the argument is going to necessarily depend on whatever the data structure wanted to do, we don't have them. Like we, as in the executing library, don't have them. They're a part of the descriptor, which is part of the user's type. Uh, so I think ultimately they have to call into the atomic. Um, and this also means that if they have some other way for them to represent the same things, um, then that's great. All good for them. Um, okay, so new takes an initial T and uh, I guess um, an initial meta. I still feel like meta and T can probably just be combined. Um, that looks like all it takes. Uh, and they s presumably start the version out at zero. Yeah, it starts out at zero. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. So this is gonna just say self uh, and it's going to have, I guess, a a version, which is going to be zero, a meta, which is going to be meta, and a value that's going to be initial. What do you mean no such field? 
right uh, to uh, self atomic pointer new box into raw box new uh, <laughs> cas by RCU of this foolish me thinking that that would work um, yeah, and this is probably needs box new. Great. So creating a new atomic is pretty straightforward. You give the initial value, which is sort of the 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 thing that you will be doing compare and swaps on. So this might be a pointer type. It might be a number, like it doesn't really matter. And then meta is the other information you need to compare. Um, okay, and what do we need to implement for this? Uh, we need to implement clone, which doesn't clone version. Okay, we'll figure out whether clone is necessary later. Um, there's a get reference which I think we don't want to implement for now. Oh, I see. So the, the tricky part here, right, is that uh, I don't want to use the word reference because it implies that the only type you can use this with are references, which isn't true. So it's like value, right, which takes self and returns a T. Um, and the challenge here is that this is really um, sort of what this used to be, right? Like this is a an unsafe dereference um, of this dot value. And so this is definitely another place where we're going to need that um, whatever that guarding for memory reclamation ends up being, that has to be a part of this too. Because otherwise, if you had an atomic, um, like what happens if the target of the atomic has been deallocated? Um, maybe the atomic actually just owns this value. That might be the answer here. Ah, no, the, the specifically the problem here is, uh, imagine someone calls value at the same time as some other thread calls compare and set, right? Then the compare and set might remove the thing that the value is referencing. And so if that gets dropped, then this reference would be invalid. Um, so this is where why we need this like concurrent memory reclamation scheme, which we don't currently have, uh, and why all of these unsafes are currently just like the the all of the unsafes here are currently safe because we don't deallocate ever. Uh, but the moment we start deallocating, uh, these unsafes would no longer be fine. Um, so like yeah, we could we could totally say like safety. This is safe because we never deallocate. Right? Which like is not a good safety guarantee. Like that's not where we want to go. We want to do better than that, but we don't currently have the mechanism to do so. Um, and like same here. Um, and I guess if we wanted to, and we probably should do this, we should have like unsafe FN um, get, which returns you a Reference. Actually, it can be safe, and it returns you a reference to the RC cas by RCU TM. But at that point, it's like unclear whether it really buys you that much. Um, Um, but it does mean that this can now be self.get. Um, 
Right, so the compare and set is really just gonna compare the old value and then do a compare and swap of the pointer, right? So this is implementing the, the scheme we drew earlier of the heap allocation being sort of the, the differentiating factor here. Um, what else does it provide? So these are all just to get the, the value and the meta. There's a get that gives you the V. Gives you the V and the mark in an array. Get with all bits. See, this is just weird. I feel like realistically what we would do here is like, maybe we require that M is copy. Um, that might be a good way to do this. But like, I don't know why this meta is just, isn't just a tuple. Is help inversion. I see. So there's some like, I see, so, so really what's going on here is like, if the user has an atomic, one thing that they might want to do is like, look at all of the values in the, the heap box at the same point in time. And so what we're gonna do here, ah, here's what we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna go the, the more of a rusty way and say, uh, with current, um, or, Maybe just width. Um, it takes an F, takes a self and a F. Uh, we can be helpful and say it also takes an R. It runs R, uh, where F is an FN once from a uh, T and an M. I really feel like this should just be T like fairly tempted to just make this T, but uh, that's fine. And what this is gonna do is it's going to do, uh, this pointer is self.get, and then we're gonna do this bit. Um, and then it's going to invoke F with this dot value and this dot meta, right? The important bit is that the, like the reason why it has all of these, like get with all bits, get is help. Like the reason it has all of these is because it needs to make sure that if it looks at, like the, the, the V it gets back is at the same instant as the mark it gets back. This is really the Java way of saying return two values, right? Really, this is like V comma Boolean, but you can't write that in Java, presumably, right? So this is a way to get both of them at the same time. And the way we're gonna do that is to say, you just give us a closure and we give you the references at the same time. Um, like this could alternatively just return a, uh, a reference to a T and a reference to the M is sort of equivalent. Doing it with a closure seems kind of nice. Like maybe this should just be a, like the alternative to with, right, is, um, get, let me do get two for now, right? And it just returns, uh, the T, the M, and the version at some some single point in time. Maybe that's just nicer. Um, the reason the width is nice is because it makes it a little bit easier for us in the future to do um, like guarding of the value, right? Like once we want to do memory deallocation, um, once you hand out references, you need to deal with make, uh, keeping track of those references so that you don't deallocate anything while the references are alive. If you do it with a closure, it's a lot easier because the moment the closure returns, 
you know that they're no longer holding on to the, the reference, at least if you require that like R is static or something, right? So I think we're gonna stick with the, the closure way. Um, and that way I think these accessors aren't even gonna be relevant anymore. Um, get with all bits, is, is help inversion. Um, can so is help inversion for example here right is get and then check whether version is equal to the value and then whether the help bit is set and you can implement that using our rust with right by doing something like um, I just want to demonstrate the the rust version of this self dot with um, and I guess actually this should also be given the version is important. Uh, you would write it as, uh, I don't care what the value is. I care that the, let's say that I've defined that my meta is these three booleans, um, right? So this, what were they called? Like mark flag help. So let's say that's a struct that holds three bools, right? Um, so MFH for short and version. Uh, this was like is, what's it called? Is help in version. And it takes a V or a version, I guess, which is U size. Um, and this is V. And then this is just like V equals version and MFH dot help. Right? That is the way you would write the equivalent of this method using just the, um, the width. And it has the same guarantees about both the both of these reads accessing the same instant in time by virtue of this just doing one read of the underlying atomic pointer. Um, um, Great. So because we have with, I don't think we need all of these like helper methods. Um, the helper methods are lame and we don't want them. Um, do we want to have meta behind a trait? How will users know that they're required to have version help and mark? We're not gonna require that is the thing. Like whether the user needs like help and mark and flag and stuff, I think is gonna depend on the data structure. It's not gonna depend on, like we're not gonna depend on them in, in our simulator, in our executor. Uh, this is why this like version triple mark reference is a thing that existed inside of a particular data structure implementation, not in the implementation of the simulator itself. Because for example, like this might be needed for the linked list, but it might not be needed for the B tree. It, the B tree might need, who knows, like other, in fact, we could look at this, right? So Fomichev here, I think is a linked list and it includes this version triple mark reference that has mark flag and help. Um, if we go into BST, I guess, um, what does it do for its uh, BST CAS desk? Uh, okay, it also uses a version triple mark reference. Uh, what about the skip list? Uh, where do we have? Who who knows? Skip combined two uh, implements I list and C list. That doesn't seem right. Aha, skip cas desk. It uses a version double mark reference. Where is version, version double? Aha, so in source, there's a version double mark reference. And that has only mark and help. So the skip list doesn't need the flag, but it needs mark and help, right? So I think this is gonna come down to whatever additional meta information any given data structure might need. If, you, if we look through this, right, my guess is that this looks exactly like the other one, except the helper methods are a little different. Um, yeah, like it has get with both bits instead of get with all bits. Is help inversion is still there. 
It has uh, it has weak compare and set and compare and set. That's interesting. Um, it has set, but ultimately the methods are sort of the same. Why is there a, a different compare and set? There are multiple compare and sets. Expect so that one takes all the arguments. That one also takes a version. Interesting. All right, we'll have to figure out which ones of these are actually needed. Um, but I think like, oh yeah, so this one has the same. So it has compare and set, it has just a straight up set, um, and it has a compare and set that takes a version as well. Uh, get state. So this can be implemented with our with, get with both bits can also be implemented with our, um, with our with. Okay, so I think uh, what we want to provide, I guess is probably also, I don't think we need version because that can also be expressed with just with. Um, so there's sort of a, a compare and set, and then it looks like they also want a compare and set with version and just a straight up set method. So I guess we can implement set. Uh, so set doesn't take expected. It just, I guess, sets the value. Uh, if new reference, I see, so, so the set really just does um, 15 just does if this dot value not equals new and this dot meta not equals new meta, then store. Or I guess it still has to be a compare and set actually. Oh, it is not. It just does a store. That's interesting. So set really is a just set. But all of them do increment the version, which I guess is the, the important part. Um, and then this one that increments the version as well, I guess should be... Well, it's... A, it's a little silly. Like in some sense, it should be like, I guess version can be an option bool, right? This is where uh, function overloading in Java is, is a little nice. Um, where we wanna say here, this just also includes the current version as a thing to compare. So if, uh, let sum v equals version, uh, and if v is not equal to this dot version, then we return false. Right, so this is like an additional guard uh, if version is, is specified. Why isn't version part of meta? Uh, version isn't part of meta because we need to be able to directly manipulate it and touch it. The stuff that's inside of meta is stuff that we don't care about. Like as in the atomic, the implementation of atomic doesn't need to access any of the stuff inside of meta. It just cares about meta as a whole. Um. But looking at this, like, I still don't think there's a reason to have meta be separate. You know? I think that it can just be a T and then we just ask the user to have a, a more structured value in there. I'm just gonna get rid of the meta man and then we can, um, It's certainly then very clear what cast by RCU does. Hmm. 
right? So this no longer has M, but we are gonna require that T implements partial eek and eek because otherwise we can't check whether um, the expected value is the same. Um, this is gonna return just this. This is just gonna be given a reference, which I feel like is just gonna be nicer. This now just takes a, like a value, which seems nicer. This just stores the new value. This takes expected and value and just does that if expected not equal value. No need to check the meta. This is just nice. That seems much nicer. Uh, oh, did I also remove T? That was silly. I think that's gonna be. I think that's gonna be good enough. And then I think the the implementation version CAS. Um, like now, in fact, we can even provide our own like, what, what was it called? Like tr uh, triple versioned tripled mark reference. So a versioned triple mark reference. Just to like see that we can do it using what we have so far, right? It's gonna have a reference, which is gonna be a T. It's gonna have a mark going to be a bool. It's going to have a flag, which is going to be a bool. It's going to have a help, which is going to be a bool. Uh, and then it's going to have, the reference actually is going to be an atomic of T. Oh, actually, it's not even going to be that. It's going to be a triplet, triple marked. This is actually just going to be an atomic of, it's just going to hold an atomic triple mark T. Which is going to hold th these things. Right, and then implement, if we now wanted to implement this, just to, to sort of have the analog to the Java code. The question is, can we write all of the methods that are in the Java code? Uh, and I'm pretty sure we can. Um, so, oops. Um, so this is just pubfn new, which takes a initial, which is a T, uh, mark, which is, I guess it's obvious that they're all initial because it, this is a constructor. Um, so it takes a flag, which is a bool, and it takes a help, which is a bool, and it returns a self. Uh, and that's really just going to be a self atomic new value. Uh, and then this is going to be a triple marked. So this is where I mean that, like, there's no reason to differentiate between the meta and the type because we can just use a new type, right? Of um, I guess this can just be value to make this a little nicer. So value mark flag help. So that's easy enough. Um, let's ignore clone for now because it seems complicated or seems annoying rather. Um, so what can we do about these? Um, pubfn, this is supposed to return a reference to the v. So get reference self, that's just going to be self dot zero dot with uh, v and we don't care about the version and we're just going to return a uh, v dot value. Uh, is marked, so you see the pattern here, right? Like all of these um, can be expressed through the use of with. Mark. Uh, 
I guess flag. It's gonna return flag is help. It's gonna return help. Uh, so I think this is a pretty good helper type. No pun intended. Um, and all of these we could also trivially implement with um, with help. Great. Um, I guess we can look at these just to make sure we can. But yeah, it's the same thing. This just looks at the mark bit and the flag bit. And this could also just be a closure. So this like version triple mark reference is trivial to implement in terms of our new atomic type, which means that our atomic type seems pretty um, seems pretty general. And then we might actually want this implementation, right? Because it seems like that's a thing that many of these data structures use. Um, so maybe it's worthwhile to include this. Um, I feel like ultimately, like all you really need is this. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just remove this. All right. Uh, so we have a, this atomic type of ours, um, and we have the version cas. And now we don't need this trade anymore. Instead, what we're going to require is that this implements version cas. So um, the commit descriptor we get needs to be able to produce a sequence of uh, versioned cas operations, descriptors, like things that are versioned cases that have yet to be executed. Um, maybe pending versioned cas is a good name. Um, hi, cat. Hello. All right, let the cat say hi. Right, let's, cat, do you wanna say hi? Oh, the light turned on, she had to leave. Light turned on. She's out of here. Um, all right, so back to this. So now I think we're in a pretty good shape to just like implement this very straightforwardly. So we loop over them. Uh, if the cast dot get state, which I guess can just be state, um, if that if let oh my. This is just if it's success, if it's failure, and otherwise. So this is a match, popularly known as a match, match state. So cast state, ah, oh, uh, success. So if we get a cast state success, then what do we want to do? Then we would do cast dot clear bit, uh, and continue. That's fine. That's implied. Uh, cast state failure, I'm going to guess it's just return i, yep, uh, and cast state pending means that it still needs to be executed. Uh, so if it's pending, that's the remainder here, then we're going to cast.execute and it looks like we don't do an error, which is kind of interesting. We just do cast.execute. And then if cast.has modified bit, then, then cast.cast state field. That's interesting. Cast state field, I don't remember us adding that as a method. Is that a method we missed? There's just set state. Which then sounds like it should be something else, right? So if we go back to um, infrastructure here, I cast desk. See, this one just has get state and set state. So it seems like something changed between the paper and the code. That's interesting. Is there even a cast 
uh, state field. There isn't. All right, so let's look at the equivalent of execute CASES. Uh, so line 53. All right, so clear bit, this is the same. Yeah, so see this one, it's actually different in the paper. The paper says if modified bit set, then do CAS. In the code, it's if modified bit set, then just set state. In fact, this is a CAS and if it turned to success, then clear. This is a set to success and clear. That's interesting. I wonder which one is right. That's problematic. These seem different. All right, we're gonna have to think. And while we're thinking, we're gonna say hi to the cat, right? All right. Hi. Do you want to say hi? Do you want to say hi? No, they're up there. They're up there. Hi. Where, where are you going? You leaving? Meow? Do you want to smell the microphone? Does it smell weird? You want to go say hi all the way up to the camera? <laughs> all right, I'll let you go. I'll let you go. You're the one who came here to meow at me. You came to meow at me. And now you just want to leave? All right. All right, back to the code. Where were we? Um... All right, let's see. So... Uh, the difference, you can see my screen again, right? I think I switched it back. Um, the difference between these is that in one, we, in one, we compare and swap and then see whether we succeeded. In the other one, we just blindly overwrite it with success and then clear the bit. You know, that's very interesting. Um, I'm gonna go with what the code does is probably right. Because the code was presumably run. Although it is a little worrying. But all right, let's go with what the code does which is uh, set state, cast state success, uh, paper and code diverge here. Cast state should definitely not take reference. Um, and then cast.clear bit. And then if cast.get, uh, cast.state not equal to cast state failure. Uh, oops, not equal to success. Then cast set state failure. This like also feels weird. And return. See here, it doesn't even return the index. Remember how we talked about in the paper where like it like returns the index of the thing? But but the code version doesn't actually return the index. This is real weird. I mean, it's easy enough for us to just return I here. But like, 
Why doesn't it... There's like something real fishy going on here. Uh, clone, copy, partial eek, eek, debug. Uh, yeah, it's real weird that this doesn't return anything anymore. Maybe it's because now that's handled by the caller or something. Or maybe post casses like walks the list. Nope. Well, I guess the paper had more things than the code does. So maybe maybe what happened was the paper gave a more general description and then in the cause of implementation, they were like, this seems like it wasn't needed. That's a little disturbing. There is no git, no. No, this is just a source dump tarball. Um, the set state internally compare and swap? That's a good question. Uh, um, let's take a look at, I guess, the Fomichev FR cast desk 45. Nope. <laughs> Set state is just, it's not even a... It just changes the value in the descriptor. Which in and of itself is bizarre. Because... Because how can it even do that? Like, there's concurrent access to these descriptors. So, how can it mutate this in place anyway? Yeah, like it's something, there's something weird. Like this set state doesn't seem like it'll be possible impl to implement because in Rust, like this is gonna take an immutable reference to self. Right, like if we look back at where this gets called from, which is in uh, base combiner. Right, like Cass here is just a it is just a, a a shared list of descriptors so you can't call set state on it i guess maybe this ends up working in java because volatile but it's not volatile yeah this seems super sketchy I mean, maybe it really just is like, it's just a, an atomic like U8 that it's fine to just store to. Um, like maybe what we'll end up doing is like, when we implement the descriptor, this will just be a, like an atomic U8 internally. But like this certainly seems kind of weird. Um, Yeah, not sure where that, that's going. Okay, that's fine. Um, so what does the paper say? It says, if the modified bit is set, then set it to success. And if it's now success, then clear the bit. And what we did was always set it to success, regardless of whether it's been changed since we set it to pending, and then always clear the bit, regardless of whether we succeeded at setting it to success. So, like in some sense, this, this, this change, I don't want to say simplification, but this change is like 
accurate because like we set it to success and then we clear the bit because it is success. In the old one, it would conditionally be success. So this, this conditional was required. I don't see why it's okay to do this unconditionally, but I'm more inclined to trust the code that was actually run. This might be something I can check with the author about too. Um, and, and then the reason, of course, we have to check here is in case some, like for example, if the modified bit is not set, then we might, then some other thread might still have put us in the success state. Um, or in a non-success state. This is definitely weird. There's something weird here. Um, why does, why is this a capital I? That's also a big problem. Like this should really not be capitalized because this is the lowercase i, which is the variable name here, I assume. Um, okay, that's fine. That is at least now, that now at least matches what the code does. Um, and so now I guess let's go down here. What is this complaining about? Uh, result commit descriptor and contention. Oh, right, we changed generator to return like an error on contention. Oh, so that people could use question mark. That's right. So, oh, that makes it a little bit more awkward to do here though. We can do this really nicely with a try block actually here. If we did like um, try, but try blocks aren't stable. But basically we sort of want like a question mark here to break rather than return. Um, I mean, we can always do that by like, if I guess match is fine. So, okay, cases is gonna be cases. Um, and error is gonna be a contention, which is gonna just break. And then this is gonna be the same, which is gonna be match this. Oh, cast. <laughs> Except the cast execute does not do that. And I guess we don't check the contention here. In fact, it looks like there isn't even a check for the contention counter in there, which is a little odd. Like it feels like there should be. It feels like cast execute should also like cast execute uh, to do, should this also return on contention? I feel like it probably should. Um, in which case we, we would want to sort of do the same kind of structure here. Um, why is this an option? Right, we changed wrap up. So the wrap up could succeed by resolving, or it could succeed in just cleaning up, or it could error in the case of contention, in which case we break. Right. And index is no longer used. That's great. Atomic U8 might be used later, but not used right now. Uh, and now it's complaining about this. That's fine. And this version is going to be a U64. That's right. We specifically chose for it to be a U64. Um, this is because Rust is annoying about references. Um, version, that should be a U64, of course, if you want to compare the version. 
this should be a compare exchange. Should arguably be a compare exchange week, actually. Um, but that's fine for now. Uh, this same thing. Uh, the this pointer that's fine. This can be a mute. That's what we get from load anyway. Um, and then here, I guess what we want to return is uh, if these are already equal, then true. Otherwise, um, we want to return if this dot is okay. And here too, there's like a if, like uh, uh, if if this fails, uh, immediately deallocate the box because we never shared it, right? So we don't actually need the fancy garbage collection in this particular case. Um, The capital return eyes is a comment that wrapped to the next line. Yeah, but then there's not a code line there. Also, no, because it has its own line number, whereas this wrapped comment does not. It's like something weird. Also, why is this typeset literal and this one's not? This is like something weird about the typesetting. Um, okay, I just want to get rid of the errors right cast execute does not currently deal with the contention which seems maybe problematic i feel like maybe execute should take care of the if we go back up to look at where they talked about the contention i feel like there was a hi cat hi cat hi cat Hi cat. Hi cat. Hi cat. You wanna come say hi? All right, come on. Oh. Oh. Do you wanna meow again? Why are you sitting so weird? Sit normal. There you go. That's better. You happy now? Is that better? Wait, let me make you full screen again. What, you want to leave again? Hey. <laughs> what? What now? You come in meowing and then you just leave. That's very rude. Very rude. Um, um, I'm just looking for the place where they talk about the contention. Um, normalized representation, contention failure counter. Yep. I expect to find this address. Because mm, I'm pretty sure we're just going to want to pass that to execute CASs and have atomic, the atomic comparison set method takes a mutable reference to a contention as well. Um, Is it helping threads must synchronize the critical points? Normal state. Normal representation. I feel like it was, it must have been further down somewhere. Oh, right. They, they talked about this in terms of like monitored run. But there's no monitored run here. So maybe it specifically shouldn't be monitored here then. 
It's weird. I, I feel like... I feel like there's almost certainly you should track uh, contention and execute cast too. Because if you think about it, like if the commit operation cast fails, that is definitely a sign of contention and you may want to back off to the slow path, right? In fact, I wonder whether they talk about this a little later. Uh, counting... A contention failure counter for all the methods in the linked list can be implemented by counting the number of failed casses. Generator, the wrap up. Okay, where's the part where they talk about original algorithm for fast path, memory management, comparison, appendix for the white free queue, contention failure counter. Yeah, I'm just going to assume that that's the case. Um, one thing that's nice about the contention counter is that it's not a uh, it's not a correction. It's not a uh, it's not a correctness measure or a correctness risk, because if you if you over approximate contention, what that means is you're just going to take the slow path more often than you otherwise would need to as so your performance goes down. Um, but correctness is still right. So this is okay. This is uh, contention. And then we're going to do this. And then this is going to be okay of error. Uh, and then this is going to be okay of okay. Okay, okay. So execute is gonna take a contention. Measure. And it's gonna return a result of bool or contention. Is what I'm thinking. Right, and then what we'll do is we'll say that this one also takes a contention, which is gonna be a mute contention measure. So the expectation is that you're gonna pass this into the atomic compare and set. Um, and if it fails, then contention dot detected Uh, this should now return a result bool contention. Which like is a little weird. I'm not going to lie. Like an okay false is also contention, but you don't have to measure it yourself, I guess. Um, and this is okay true. And this is... I guess what we'll do is we'll match on this because we, we have to, we sort of have to match on it anyway because we want to deal with the case where um, uh, where we can immediately deallocate. So if it's okay, what does that even mean? We don't care about the value in the case of an okay. Uh, we can just return okay true. Um, but if it returned an error, I guess we'll, we'll probably care about the error type um, but if it returned an error, then contention was detected. And we want to return OK false. Um, and this returns the current, which we don't actually care about the current value. But we do care about the value we tried to stick in there which is going to be uh, new. So this is going to try to con compare exchange in the new, or I guess new pointer maybe. 
so in this case, we want to do box from raw new pointer. Safety, uh, the box was never shared. So this way we guarantee that that deallocation, that allocation ends up going away. Uh, but we still detect contention. And so now I guess this will still be okay, false. Um, ooh. What does help do though, if it detects contention? I guess if, if we detect contention when executing a cast, then we just continue, right? This is just gonna be a match on this. Uh, if outcome is just gonna be outcome and error contention, contention is gonna be continue. Same here, let's format this nicely. There's probably another one of these is my guess, right up here. Right, so now this one can be the same thing where if there was contention, then we break. Um, so, so the observation here is we're basically trying to make it so that the user doesn't have to manually deal with the contention counter uh, as long as they use our atomic type. They may want to increment con the contention counter themselves, which is sort of why we provide it to them in certain other cases. And this is described in like Appendix B, I think, of the paper. Um, like there are certain cases where you might want to say that there's contention, even if it wasn't because a particular cast failed. Um, but, but it really does feel like cast execute also needs to sort of participate in, uh, in observing contention. Um, this does need to be pub, that's true. Huh? Does it compile? Is it possible? It does compile, great. So I think now we have, if we, if we look down at figure five, Right, we've now encoded all of execute casts. And now let's look at the post casts, um, which I think we did last time, but let's just make sure that that is the case. Um, so post casts. So there's cast execute and there's post casts. Where does post casts get executed from? Is it only from help? I think it's only from help. Um, the real question is, on the fast path, do we also need to call post casts? I don't think we do. I think it's only used by help. I mean, this is easy enough to find out if we go to um, base combiner, I guess, which is the main one. So where is like the main operation? <laughs> there is no main base. Oh, I guess the, it's all done with a extension because of course it is FR combined three. Let's go with the highest number. Extends base combiner. Uh, so let's look at like some random operation, like I guess, delete. Interesting. So here there certainly seems to be like a bunch of stuff that happens in delete beyond ask for help. So this is what we've tried to encode in our 
run method, right, is that if help, then ask for help, except here that's like encoded in the, in the consumer. And then we call generator, oh, I see what's going on. Um, in, in our implementation of run, our fast path calls like generator, then cast execute, and then wrap up. Um, but for them, they actually call like the original algorithm, right? And then only if they detect contention there, do they end up asking for help. That's interesting. This is probably so that the fast path is even faster, right? Like rather than go through the generator and stuff, um, which is what you end up doing if you do this like ask for help business, right? Um, they just have the fast path directly encoded in the method and then sort of fall back to the slow path um, as appropriate. So maybe what we want to do here is like, have a uh, where's where's our trait i have too many things in this file now like maybe what we want is like a fast path which takes a self and an op and a contention um and it returns a result of either self output or contention output and then i feel like we probably want to encode this first bit but what we'll do is What does help first? So help first calls help op, which is the one that ends up calling generator and cast execute and wrap up. And then run, I think we're just gonna say, rather than it doing the same thing, it's gonna do match uh, self algorithm fast path of the operation. And of course, a mute to the to the contention counter. And if that just gives you the result, then we return the result directly. And if it returns contention, then we then we do nothing. I think that's what we want. Because then we retry the fast path. And otherwise we fall back to the slow path, right? So, so that's something that seems to be like it's encoded directly in here, right? It's like, this is the first bit for, for helping. Uh, oh, I see, this is, this is their encoding of like, there's like a setting where you always go through the, the helping loop rather than do the, the fast path. This is basically always use the slow path. Um, so first help, then the normal fast path operation. And if it returns null, I guess that means contention. That means ask for help. Um, and this is like the retry loop where they retry the fast path and on contention go to the slow path. and otherwise fall back to ask for help. So is that generally the case for all of them? So delete is, this is the always slow path. Uh, this is the contention. This is generally the fast path. And again, contention, then go to the slow path. Um, who knows what this does? Yeah, there's like, the, the, I guess there's a question here of how much do you leave up to the implementer of the data structure to like choose when to go slow or fast, right? Like, okay, for 
Do they have a contains? That's not helpful. Interesting. Here it even gets to override the postcasts method. I was like, there's definitely a leaky abstraction here, which is a little worrying. Um, it even it overrides precasts. Oh no, this is just the the override is just the implementation of the method for the trait. Got it. Although shouldn't that just be generator? Like I feel like something's off here, but maybe I'm just like why aren't these called generator and wrap up? Is what I want to know. Like this definitely dif differs from the way that the paper is structured, right? Which is that help manages the state machine. And then there's not a precast and a postcast. There is a generator and a wrap up. And precast and postcast are like dictated implementations that call wrap up and generator. So here I sort of trust the paper more, or at least the paper has a cleaner abstraction for this. Um, rather than having each one implement like precasts itself. I mean, I guess one way to look at this is like, if we combine, if we compare um, like this to, I don't know, um, source, I don't know, combine list to dot Java. Um, if that was probably not very helpful. <laughs> All right, let me just open up this and go to precast. Precast. Um, and then open up, I guess, source combined list two and search for it precast. Yeah, like they're the same. And you see really what they do is they call the appropriate, the appropriate generator method for the operation. And then just stick that in the, stick that compare and set into the box. And what about the postcast? So the postcast here and the postcast here You see, the postcast here just like loops through and doesn't do any of the other things that our postcasts, like the postcast from the paper has this like monitored run, should restart. I guess this does have a restart, but this postcast has like other bits in it. So there's a, hmm. It's a little disturbing that the implementation varies from the paper's model here. It just makes it hard to figure out what the right abstraction should be. I think what we should do is stick to the paper and then when we implement the data structures later, um, we sort of then figure out whether we can make it fit in the model that the paper sets. Um, it does raise the question of like, should the fast path be, I do think it makes sense for the fast path to be its own implementation so that the implementer can choose to have its own like good fast path, um, rather than have to go through the, the generator and stuff that I think makes sense. I think we're going to keep. We're gonna keep our run method here and just see whether that this structure and forcing the structure makes sense. I'm guessing it probably does. One option, right, is that we don't have a retry loop. We just say that the retry loop is something that should be in the fast path specifically for the, again, the fast path implementation in the implementer, uh, but we can look at that later. Um, so I think postcast then is one thing we need to adjust because it needs to match this postcasts. Um, 
because currently we just call wrap up, which like sort of is what this does, right? Should we should restart an operation result? Oh, we've actually already encoded this. I remember us doing this. It was just a question of the monitored run and monitored run we do with a contention measure and then matching on contention. So I think we're good there. Um, I think that means that we actually now have an encoding of the simulator that at least in theory is right. Uh, and I think the big thing that's missing now is the actual wait-free queue that's going to be like the help queue, the underlying thing, and then trying to implement a data, stru data structure on top of it. Um, let's pause there. We've been talking for a long time. We've gone through a lot of different bits. I think this is a great place to like pause, collect our thoughts before we dive into this help queue, which is really just going to be its own separate implementation. Um, so let's do some questions about how far we've gotten so far. Then we'll take a little bit of a break to like go to the bathroom or make tea or whatever. Um, and then we'll keep going with this. Whew. Ship it. Yeah, it compiles, I know, right? Uh, you can use ternary operator and precasses. Where? In precasses. I'm not sure what you're referring to. I mean, I know what the ternary operator is, but I, I don't see how it applies here. All right, does the, the general structure of what we built so far make sense and why it was a little weird that these um, that the paper and the implementation differed? And also sort of what we have and what we don't have so far. Actually, how about I go away quickly and come back shortly, and then you discuss amongst yourselves whether you have questions. I'm back. Can you, I assume you can hear me and see my screen. I'm always paranoid that I like come back and then forget to either unmute myself or forget to switch to my screen. So everyone's like, I can't see anything. No. Yeah, this is very much like it's research. Here we dragons. Like the only person who's successfully run the code is probably the person who wrote the paper. Um, 
which is like unfortunate, but it is nice that we have the code for reference at least. What I'll probably do is um, is chat to the um, chat to the original author and sort of ask him a little bit. One thing that's sort of unfortunate, right, is that this paper was originally pub published in 2014, 2015. Um, and then there was a revision of it in 2017. That's like a, the longer version that we're working on now. But the author hasn't worked on this for like five years. And it's um, as far as I've understood, it's like worked on completely different things since. And so it's unclear that anyone really knows how this works at this point or what the code, how the code works at least. Um, so like it might be, we're sort of trying to reverse engineer understanding. Um, not fully grasping the paper as a whole, but it seems like a pretty big deviation. What deviation? We haven't really deviated from anything currently. Um, oh, you mean the deviation between the Java code from the author and the paper? Um, it's not really a deviation as much as it is um, a like leaky abstraction. Like the paper presents a, a, a clean abstraction between post casses and pre casses, which is implemented by the simulator and the generator and the wrap up methods that are implemented by the data structure. And that clean separation doesn't seem to quite be there in the, um, in the code. It, what could be the case actually is that maybe um, they realized later that they can do that clean separation, but they didn't update all of the data structures to use that clean separation or that that's in like not in the version of the code I have. It's not entirely clear. Hmm. I guess we dealt with this to do. Result, result, unit U size contention is a real weird return type. I think Clippy is going to yell at me. But like, it sort of is accurate, right? Like, I mean, we could have a type alias for like maybe contention, but like it really is a either the cas execute failed to do its job in that there was contention, so it returned early, or the cas execute ran, and what we get is the result of the casses. But I mean, the other way to represent this, right, is to unify the error types and say, like, cas execute returns either unit or an error type that is an enum of cast failed and contention. Maybe that's nicer. Maybe we should just do that. Mm. It's only really used internally anyway. Um, right, so we can do like enum uh, cast execute failure is either a and we're also gonna implement from contention for that. So the question mark will work. Um, and we'll do, I can either be a cast failed of a U size or contention. Contention. Right, and then we say this is going to return a result of uh, cast execute failure, and this is going to be a error of cast execute failure, cast failed, and it's like the question of is this nicer? I think maybe it is. I suppose. 
and this question mark still works because of the from implementation. Um, then anywhere that calls this now needs to deal with, right, so this, now we get into a slightly weird case where this now becomes okay of outcome. And this becomes, um, if this is execute, cast execute failure, cast failed I, then it's error of I. Uh, and if it's cast execute contention, contention, then we continue. Maybe that's nicer. Not entirely sure. Mm. All right. Still haven't done a git commit. Maybe I should do a git commit. Nah, I'll do it later. Okay, I think the big next question now is implementing, unless there are other questions about what we've done so far. I think the next question now is, um, Uh, how we implement the wait free queue. So as a reminder, this is where anytime we go to the slow path, we need to sort of put up a description of the work that we want to do and stick it on that queue. And every time we are about to do an operation, we want to take, we want to see whether the, the queue of people looking for help is, is uh, non empty. And if so, try to help them make progress. Um, and because we want the whole thing to be wait free, uh, any operation on the help queue has to be wait free. And that means that we need to implement a wait free queue. Um, now, luckily, the paper authors already wrote one, um, which is an adaptation of another wait free queue that someone else implemented. Um, this is adapted specifically for this use case. Um, and the code is down here. I love reading code, Java code in literal wrapped PDFs, like literally typed. PDFs with line wrapping and page wrapping. It's great. Okay. Mm. So a help queue. What's a help queue do? Atomic reference. All right. So there's a node type. It's pretty common. I think. Let's probably make this its own module. I really need to like organize this code. The, the re biggest reason I haven't split this into multiple files and such is because as you've seen over the course of the stream, we've moved so much stuff around because we're still sort of coming to, to grips with what the interface should be, what the abstraction um, points should be and the layers should be. And so it's nice to have it all in one file where you can just like rejig it around. Um, but the help queue is sort of unique in that we know what its interface is going to be, and we know that it's just going to be a self-contained thing. So uh, it makes a lot of sense for it to just be in its own module. Yeah, so that's that's my plan. Uh, so we're going to have our first module. Um, thank you. I don't think we're actually going to need phantom data, but you know, we need operation record box and normalized lock free. We may actually not need these types, but we'll have them there for now. Right. And this needs to use help queue, help queue. And this need to be pub crate because we're going to use it outside of here. Uh, and same goes for NQ, P can try remove front. Great. And the phantom data use up here can go away. All right, so now we need to figure out how to implement a help queue. Let's see what we got. So we have a node type. Mm. There's a value, that makes sense. There's a next, which is an atomic reference. So this is an atomic pointer, but it also includes the, it's gonna eventually have to include the logic around um, garbage collection. It has T 
TID is probably the thread ID. So it's like the enqueuing threads ID and the dequeuing threads ID. They're a little weird. Hmm. There's a, um, I guess, operation description. Phase pending enqueue. So this is probably like, remember how the way you make something wait free is you make people help each other or threads help each other which means that this wait free queue which we're using for the queue of things to help needs to have its own way to describe things to be helped internally which is probably what this op desk is going to be um atomic reference head tail atomic reference array What is an atomic reference array? Oh, it's an ar array of atomics. But Okay, good. You need to give a length. But What's the length? Oh no. That's awkward. The array whole, it's an array of, uh, that's like bounded by the total number of threads, which is a value we don't really know. And in general, you don't really know. Like, what? What is this? Te Test.num threads sounds an awful lot like the wrong value. I want to look at what the code does here. Uh, base combiner? No. That doesn't look right. This doesn't look right at all. This is... Okay, this is not giving me the results that I need. I'm guessing this is like, um, it seems like this is like a J unit value or something, but This seems really problematic. Um, Cause like, okay, what if someone spawns another thread that wants to access this thing? What happens? Then I guess this TID will just be out of bounds and then the whole thing will just crash. Like, what happens if I call get with a value that's too large. I mean, I, I assume it just throws or something. Like there was an exception. Like this seems sketchy. The test of Java file in source. That's awful. Um, I 
Well, um, <clears throat> that's interesting. I'm not quite sure what we do here. Uh, I mean, it seems like this implementation needs to know the number of threads. Um, yeah, because you see what it does is when you enqueue, you basically set the state of this thread in that array, which means that, and the idea of course is that because every thread has its own um, index, it can like atomically operate on that index all at once. And other threads can help on its index by just walking the list of things. But if you don't know the number of threads, then you have no way of doing this. Um, I mean, we could say that every time you want to clone a new handle to it, we'll like take a mutex and like, the problem is this can't be a vector, right? Because if the vector needs to grow, who grows the vector when there are lots of threads with concurrent access? That's why it's an array here. Um, how does it even get the thread ID? What does it use as the thread ID here? That's what I want to know. Ask for help just takes the thread ID. Okay. Ask for help. Delete is just past the thread ID. Um, well, Hmm, I see. So basically you need to say in advance, so it doesn't have to be thread IDs. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we think about this for a second, um, what this is saying is that every handle to the data structure needs to have a distinct identifier. And they're, they're sort of proxying that by thread ID here, but it doesn't need to be. And you need to declare in advance how many handles you want there to be. So one option Well, it's like a question of whether it should be send or not, but one option here, right, is to use const generics and say um, oops, uh, there. So our help queue is going to be generic over that. And that means our generator, uh, sorry, our simulator rather, also needs to be generic over that. Um, and then what we can do is we can say like, How's this gonna work? Um, like, uh, all right, let's say, there's not a cl try clone, is there? But, but if we say, um, Why does, why do we need this trait bound all the way down? Oh, it's because this needs to name an associated type. That's really stupid. Um, okay, so, so here's what we can do. Here's what I'm thinking. Um, 
we make it so that if you have a weight free simulator, like you can always create your first one. What am I doing there? Uh, pub FN new, right? There's going to be some new that gives you a, a, a new one. And then we can say pub FN like fork, um, which gives you a result self and uh, too many handles, right? And what fork will do is what will fork do? Hmm. Um, so let's say that the help queue. Okay, there's going to have to be a sort of a shared struct that holds the actual help queue and holds the algorithm and holds identifiers. And this is going to be an atomic U size. Maybe you already see what I'm getting at here. Um, and then we're going to say that this is going to have shared, which is going to be an arc to shared of L, F, and N. Uh, all right, so I want atomic U size and I want standard sync arc. This needs to be generic over all of this as well. That's fine. Um, Two, okay, that's fine. This is const and u size and um, and this is self shared help, self shared help. So all of these are just going to have to access through shared. So the idea here, right, is that. Um, it's really unfortunate that this is the case, um, that we need to have this like handle. But basically what we're saying is that rather than allow people just have like a weight free simulator that they themselves stick in a uh, in an arc, they actually need to explicitly have a handle to one. So we have to do the, the arcing for them. It's really unfortunate. It means that you can't like, you can't stick it in a static, for example. Um, but we may just have to live with that. This might actually mean that we can use epic-based uh, garbage collection too, because we can store the guards in the handles, right? So we could store a like a crossbeam epic guard in here. Um, but what I'm imagining, right, is I is self dot uh, shared dot. This should really be handles. Handles dot fetch add one. Um, and then if I is greater than or equal to n, uh, then return error of too many handles. Otherwise, okay of self of uh, shared to self dot shared and I is I. And this then needs to do self dot share dot handles dot fetch sub because it needs to uh, make sure that in the future if someone gives one up uh, we don't just keep inc inc uh, incrementing it and then we'll do like a, a drop uh, implement drop for this 
uh, mute self, which is going to just return the, oh, it can't return the I either because it needs to return its I, not just any I. Oh, handles are a pain. All right, my thinking here was that this way we're like ensuring that there are only ever n handles. Um, the problem is that when I drop, like imagine that I create eight handles and I have the maximum number of eight. I create eight handles, then I drop the fifth one. Then now if someone tries to create a new handle, it needs to get an ID of five right, or four, it needs to get the ID of the one that was last, or of one that has been dropped, um, but this scheme won't do that. Um, <laughs> okay, so the other alternative here, and this is even stupider. We're just gonna do this, screw it. <laughs> so uh, you, you can't give back handles. Like the moment you reserve a handle, it's yours forever. And then we'll just leave users to, don't fork if you don't have to. This is dumb, right? I, I'm not saying this is a good API, but in the interest of making progress, I think we can do this because behind the scenes, you could always improve fork so that it knows how to manage these like multiple IDs. Ooh, here's an option. This is even stupider, but maybe we're gonna do it. Um, Free handles is going to be a vector of u size. In fact, it's going to not even be that. It's going to be a mm. It's really going to be a In some sense is going to be a bool of n, but I don't want to make it a bool of n. So my, my thinking here is I want this to be a mutex because I'm fine with fork not being weight free. If you have to take a lock in order to get one, I'm okay with that. That way we can at least fix this, this silliness. Um, so what we'll do is say free handles is gonna be, fine, I'm just gonna make it a vec u size for now. And it's, it's, it's dumb for so many reasons, but we're gonna lock, unwrap, pop, Um, and then we're going to say, if let some I is that, uh, then you can get your handle. Otherwise, there are too many handles. Uh, and now we can implement drop. For this, which is going to be... Um, Self.share. Free handles dot lock dot unwrap dot push self dot i and then new is going to be self of uh, first of all it's going to assert that um, n is not zero 
arc is going to be an arc new of a shared. Um, and we're going to start out with i being 0. Uh, this is going to have, I guess this is going to take an algorithm, which is going to be the algorithm. It's going to take a help q new um, and free handles. And this is going to be real dumb. It's going to be one dot dot n dot collect uh, mutex new. And we don't have a new for help queue yet. Um, And this is fine, right? Like it's just a vec of u sizes. It's not actually a vec of like thread descriptors. It's just an integer. Um, it's really just a handle ID, if you will. Um, and so now when you fork, you, you take a lock. So it's not wait free to get a new handle. But once you have a handle, all the operations are wait free. Um, and when you drop, you just return whichever I you originally got when you created the handle. Um, it is really unfortunate that this n has to be hard coded. Maybe one day we can get rid of that. Um, but now the help queue. So now in the help queue, this is going to be generic over n uh, pub fn new, which is going to return a self. Um, uh, it's going to be a to do because, of course. Now will this compile? Great. And I can get rid of the atomic use size. Nice. Um, I don't understand why we pop the vec in fork. Uh, we pop the vec in fork because we need to get an identifier. So the free handles is a list of handle IDs that aren't currently used. And so we just take one of them and pop is one of them, like any of them is just as good as any other. Um, that's why. Uh, so now I guess we can actually implement this. Um, if we go back to look at the actual code, because that seems nicer. Um, all right, so node is just a node in a linked list, right? Next to an atomic reference. Mm, these identifiers, that's fine. Mm, operational descriptor, that's fine. That's basically the help queue. I see so the observation here, what this is doing, right, is saying in this in this other larger data structure, we don't want to encode. We, we use the linked list as a way to encode all of the possible help things or things that might need help. Here, we're not using a linked list, we're using an array. Um, in some sense, like once you have this requirement, why not just use an array in the other one as well? Like uh, something is weird, but it's fine. Um, so the constructor here for the wait-free queue is you Create a sentinel, which is going to be the indicator for the empty list. Uh, you create a new thing that has like a operational descriptor per thread. So this is where the observation comes in that you don't actually need a like a linked list of help operations because you know the maximum number of help operations, which is the number of threads or number of handles rather. Um, and I guess it's maybe the reason we do that here is because this is going to allocate n of this size, like if there are n handles, n times size of opdesk. We, that's probably fine here because opdesk is kind of small. Um, but for the other data structures, the help structure might itself be pretty large. And so maybe that's why they, they want to use a list here. Um, interesting. OK, I guess we just start encoding this. Um, shouldn't one to n collect be a zero to n collect? No, 
That's very intentional. It's a good catch, but no. Uh, it's because the, the self we return has already taken the identifier zero. Turn has already claimed zero, therefore one. Um, so let's see, maybe we should just start encoding this and then see, actually, no, let's read a little bit more. Um, head and tail pointer, that's pretty standard. It initializes the state array to be I don't need help, I suppose. Um, what is the actual operational descriptor? Face, pending, and queue, and a node. I see. It's like in, in some sense, this could be a thread local, except that you need some way of iterating all of the threads, thread locals. Hmm. I was thinking whether we can make this const, but I don't think we can because of the node. Oh, maybe. Maybe actually. Because that node is an option. This is really an option node because it's allowed to be null. Which really suggests that opdesk should be an enum. Or maybe it should just be, maybe the whole opdesk should be an option. Like this should be an array of option opdesk. That's probably really what's going on. Which is in Q gets the phase. And it sets his opdesk to be new opdesk. All right, are these heap allocated because they need to, probably, there's an atomic reference. So that means it also needs to be handled by the memory reclamation scheme we use. I don't know if it's gonna need to do Probably doesn't need a compare and swap because any given index will only ever be updated by that handle and be read by others. So there's no there's no chance of an ABA problem happening, I think, because I don't think any other thread will ever, hi cat. I don't think any other thread will ever modify it. Oh, there's help. What does finish ink do? Get state dot get tid dot face false true next. Also, there is a compare and swap on help finish. I'm just trying to figure out whether there's an ABA problem here. And it looks like there might be, which maybe means this needs to be versioned as well. Well, there's no versioning here. This just declares a new one. Although, because it's using the, because it's using the pointer, you don't have, like this is doing RCU again, which means you don't have the ABA problem for the same reason why we don't have the ABA problem when we're using the heap allocation for the thing to do, like versioning and meta and stuff. Um, that's a little awkward if each of these is a heap allocation as well, but it seems like it might have to be because this updates Let's see, so when you in queue, what do you put there? Phase, true, true, and a new node. And when it gets updated, it's phase, false, true, and next. I 
Why isn't this curdesk dot phase? This feels like it could be curdesk, which just means it's updating that in place. Maybe it's only this one that gets updated. Next is last dot next dot get. This just feels super racy, but I guess like I'm I'm assuming this is a reasonable implementation. All right, let's go with the let's try to not optimize too much and and go with the way that this is implemented in the first place. And just do the heap allocations and then like do RCU and heap allocations and then um, if necessary, change it back. Um, so I guess peak head is just you look at the head. That's easy enough. Um, and Q is set the state for your thread. Then help. I'm guessing it's like help everyone in the same phase as your operation is in. And then finish the encoding of the help action you inserted. So really here, all the work is happening in help. Unlike the other one where you had like a fast path, here is just only slow path. Like doing an operation means sticking it on the help queue and then helping until your thing completes. Um, conditionally remove head. I wonder why this has to help. All right, let's try this out. Um, so we're gonna need a class. Oh, John. Uh, we're gonna need a node, which is gonna hold a value V. It's a good question. What's even going to be in these? I think it's going to be these things, uh, which means node is going to be generic over LF. And we're going to have to require this. Which means we're going to require this all so that we can name this type. Um, so that is the value. Uh, there's a next, which is an atomic. Oops. I guess we should also grab these, which is an atomic pointer to a node. Um, to a node LF, sorry about that. Actually, let's be even better and say to a self. Um, there is the ink. I'm gonna go ink I, because we've used I instead of TID. Although maybe that's gonna be confusing because that might be the index. So let's have all of these be ID instead of just I. And this is gonna be free IDs. Free IDs. And this is gonna be ID. And this is gonna be IDs. And this is gonna be ID. And this is gonna be IDs. And this is gonna be ID. So I guess actually, uh, this also means that probably all of the NQ operations are gonna take that identifier. Which sort of suggests that actually the fork method should be on help queue rather than on wait free simulator. But let's leave it up there for now and just say that these, this is all gonna take an ID, which is gonna be a U size. Uh, this probably doesn't need to, in fact, is it only in Q that needs it? Peak head doesn't and conditionally remove head doesn't. So only this one takes an ID. And then over here, this is then gonna take self.id. 
Um, okay, so the Ankh ID is going to be a U size. Um, what else we got up here? Uh, we have the deck ID, which is an atomic U size. Not entirely clear why that is yet, but I guess we will soon find out. Um, and there's a constructor for node that's easy enough. Um, which takes a value, which is one of these. Um, I guess we could actually make a, a fully generic help queue and then say that help queue is a variant that takes this. Maybe that'll make this a little bit nicer so we don't have to carry all these around. Um, so we're gonna say that a help queue is really just a wait of, uh, is really just a wait free help queue of this uh, and then we can do that way we can just be fully generic down here which is going to be a little bit nicer um, so this is just going to be a T and we don't necessarily know what that's going to look like yet but at least it means we don't have to carry these long bounds around everywhere and just say this holds a T takes a T, etc. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll have uh, these methods all be on wait free help QT, right? And say that they all just take a T, return a reference to a T. Uh, or something like there's something odd here that we need to figure out. Um, this may end up operating on like raw pointers or something. I'm not quite sure. Um, and then this is really just going to be self dot the wait free queue dot nq id and help. So this is just a essentially this is just a forwarding. In fact, this can just be a type alias. Uh, and that way, these can all just go away. Um, and we don't actually know what new node is. Oh, I guess new node is pretty easy. Um, it is just going to be a self of where the value is the value. Next is atomic pointer. Is there a null? New. Uh, standard pointer, null pointer. The enqueuing ID, oh, I see. So this needs to take an enq ID, which is going to be a U size, and stick that in there. And this is going to be an atomic integer. So it needs to be able to be minus one. And that's just because we don't have atomic options. But that's fine. We can use, we can live with this being a uh, minus one. Technically, that means that half of the NQ ID space can't be used, um, which is a little awkward, but such is life. Um, and then what's this op desk? This is going to be a struct. I still feel like this is probably going to end up being a uh, an enum. But there's going to be, let's see, face, which is a, an i64. Um, pending, which is a bool. And q, which is a bool. 
node, which is a node, which means this has to be generic over T. Uh, and there's a constructor for that too, opdesk T FNU, and it takes all of the fields. So it doesn't have a constructor in other words, that's fine. And I guess now we start to look at what the actual help queue contains. So it has, um, the actual help queue has a atomic pointer to a node of T and has a head, which is this. It has a tail, which is the same. Uh, and then it has this like state array, which is gonna be a atomic pointer, an array of atomic pointer to op desk of T of length N. Um, this is where this const N U size is gonna come in. Right? Um, and then there's also n queued and d queued, which feel like they're probably just there for debugging, maybe. Yeah, they're not actually necessary. So we could have, they're basically for metrics collection, like for stats. Um, like this is probably handy, handy in debugging, but like, in fact, we can do this here too, right? We could say um, uh, enqueued or enked um, atomic u size, but I'm not, I'm not gonna do that now. We're gonna keep it simple for now. Uh, is that constant an example of refinement type? No, this is a constant generics type. There's no refinement here. Um, All right, so we have a head and a tail, and then this is gonna have a new. Um, a new is going to take um, no arguments, apparently, and return a self. And what's it gonna do? It's gonna create a sentinel. It's gonna be node new is going to be null, uh, which so that means that's an option T. Uh, so node new of none and minus one. So I guess this has this does have to be an I size. That's fine. Um, and then we're gonna say, oops. Then we're gonna say that the head is gonna be atomic pointer new of I guess box new box into raw. We've done this dance before. Um, this is going to be pointing to the sentinel and the tail is also going to point to the sentinel. Uh, state is going to be well, so state is going to be a little bit weird because I guess we want like a const uh, empty state. All right, let me write this in the long form and then see why we have to change it first. So this is going to be a op, op desk of length n. Right, where the phase is minus one. Uh, pending is false, right? Second, yeah. Uh, this one is true, apparently, and node is null. Which 
means node is none, which means node here is an option node. And I forgot a comma. Um, so this won't actually compile. Um, or, or uh, this eventually won't compile because you can't um, you can't create a race this way um, just by repetition. You have you can only do that if this is const if this is specifically a const value. So this is like an empty desk. Uh, is this and then you can do it here. But this is going to complain because you're not allowed to have one that's generic. Can't use generic parameters from outer function in the inner one. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit of a pain. Um, yeah. It's going to be a little bit of a pain. Basically, the problem here is we need we need to construct the array, but to construct array, you have to have all of the values at the same time, um, but they're all the same, which you can only express if their type is copy. Like you can put a type in here, if the, you can put a value directly in there if the value's type is copy, but opdesk isn't copy because it contains, it may contain a node, even though it doesn't currently contain a node. So we try to make it uh, cons to indicate that it doesn't contain anything that can't be copied, but we can't use the T in that name. Uh, maybe we can type erase the node here because it's just going to be a raw pointer anyway. I'm going to have to think about this a little. That's going to be a little annoying to deal with. The You can always work around this by creating a um, a vector of the appropriate type. Like, it's real dumb. Like, I mean, this is, it, the restriction is there for a good reason, but the way we have to work around it is real dumb, which is basically we say state is like zero to n dot map, ignore the i, give me an op desk for each one, dot collect dot try into dot uh, uh, expect gave n elements and then we say this has to be of type uh, atomic pointer op desk t length n it's going to complain probably here that this has to be atomic pointer new box new box into raw uh, this. So now that's state. But um, th this is a restriction that's going to be ultimately relaxed, that you are allowed to name the T or just use a value where the constructor happens to be constant. Um, but it's just not something that you can currently do. Like to do... Uh, once const can depend on t, make this constant instead of via vec. Instead of going via vec. Um, could also make it maybe on init. Um, that's the other way to do it. But. If I can avoid writing on safe code, I will avoid writing on safe code. And like n here is likely to be small anyway. And this is one time construction, so I'm not too worried about it. And eventually there'll be a um, fast, safe way to do it. So I'm okay with it. Um, and then it just constructs, I guess, self uh, from these. So head, tail, state. So that's great. Um, let's look at, so NQ is the most complicated operation. So let's just skip over that for now uh, and look at peak head. So peak is just 
real straightforward, right? Which is um, node is uh, self dot head dot load. I'm just gonna make all of these be sequentially consistent, even though that's not necessarily necessary. Um, so we know that we know that this is always okay to dereference because we never deallocate. <laughs> it's such a such a lame um, such a lame reason why. Um, so we load. Why does this get the next? This doesn't peak. Oh, I see the head is a... What? Head dot next. Head dot compare and set. Doesn't it skip the thing that's actually at the head? It gets what's at the head, like what the head pointer is pointing at. Then it looks at the next element and gets that. And then it returns the value. So this should return the second element, not the first. Right? I was wondering, like, maybe the head is always like a sentinel value or something. But if you look at conditionally remove head, it does head dot get to get the current head, gets the next. And then replaces the thing that's in head. Like it re replaces what head points to. It doesn't replace head's next pointer. Um, but it does compare expected value to the, there's like something weird going on here. Now peak head is supposed to give you a reference to the first element of the list. But this seems like it gives you the second element of the list. Unless the head is like always a sentinel value, right? Like head is always just a node that doesn't hold the value in and of itself and only the next one holds the value. But that doesn't seem to be true because in conditionally remove head, we truly remove the thing that's at the head, not its next. Conditionally remove head, gets the current head, finds the next pointer. It shouldn't be possible for the next pointer to be null unless the head pointer is the sentinel, right? So this is checking for the sentinel, that's fine. Or if the next value equals the expected, if, if the next value does not equal the expected value, then return false. Okay, that's fine. And then we replace, then we replace the current head with its next pointer. So what ends up getting removed is the thing that's at the head. So the thing at the head can't be the sentinel pointer because then conditionally remove head would only ever remove the sentinel pointer, which makes no sense. Also, why does this set? That's the thing that was removed, I see.
Yeah, head dot. Th this head dot get gets the first node, right? Like head is a atomic reference to a node that initially starts up being the sentinel. But when you enqueue, See, here's what's weird. Um, and Q pushes to the end, like it uses the tail pointer, right? Which makes me think that the the head pointer really is always the, the head node is always the sentinel. This the feeling I get. And if the head pointer is always the sentinel, then peak head makes sense because First element is the sentinel, so you always want to return whatever is immediately after the sentinel. Um, but conditionally remove head doesn't make sense. Specifically, this line, why would that not end up removing the sentinel? Because this is checking the value of the next thing. Like, shouldn't this be head dot next? Or, like, there's something real fishy about this. It feels like conditionally remove head will just never succeed. Or rather, no, it, it will succeed, but it won't do. See, okay, well, what, what I thought this was going to do, right, is that this would, if, if head is indeed the sentinel, always, then this should compare and set head's next pointer to be the following pointer. But that's not what this does. This changes head itself to point directly to next, which would bypass the sentinel. And from that point forward, peak head would be wrong because the first element wouldn't be the sentinel anymore. What does the paper say here? Well, like, what's the paper code? No? Paper code is the same thing. And what's, what's particularly, what makes me think that this is wrong is that this is comparing the value of the next. So it's clearly they expect that the expected value that's passed in is gonna be contained in next, not in head, right? So it's, it's intending to remove next, but but that's not what this does. Unless like, no, the compare and set method is on atomic reference. Like my, my, my expectation here would be that this would be head or I guess cur head dot next compare and set next uh i guess cur head dot next next dot next or er, no next and next dot next dot get Right, like that's how you remove next, if that is indeed your goal.
and that this would be next dot next dot set null. That feels like what the code should be doing. The, the reason I'm, the reason I'm hesitating, uh, the reason I'm doubting myself here is because this code has been run, right? Like they did all sorts of experiments with it, that there are results in the paper. So clearly it, it's not wrong or, or if it's wrong, it's not wrong in a way that matters. So what would happen with this code as is? Conditionally remove head would end up removing the sentinel, which is fine. Although the Yeah, I think removing the sentinel is probably fine. Although it'll make the next. Okay. This breaks if you do a. Okay, you can't do a conditionally remove head until their sentinel is no longer the head of the list. So you need to do an NQ first, otherwise you can't do conditionally remove head anyway. So someone does an NQ, which means that now from this point forward, okay, so now the tail pointer points to the thing we just NQ'd. Then you conditionally remove the head, which is gonna remove the sentinel, but not the value. Now the value is the first. Now you call peak and you get null when really there is a value there. I'm pretty sure this is just wrong, but the way that it'll manifest is just that you'll end up leaving a completed operation at the start of the help queue. I think what'll happen is you will, yeah. Sorry, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm lost in thought. Um, so, so let me try to explain what's going on. So this data structure has a head pointer and a tail pointer, right? And initially it constructs a node it calls the sentinel. That's terribly written, but it says sentinel. Um, and head and tail both point to this. Um, what happens when you do an NQ, I mean, we haven't gone through it, but basically the, the end result after an NQ, uh, at least as far as I assume, is you end up with head pointing to still the, the sentinel, and the sentinel has a next pointer. So let's, let's say I queue this little box. Um, then there's gonna be a second box that's gonna have a pointer into this value and a next pointer that points to nothing. Right, there's nothing there. Uh, and the tail is now gonna to point to this node. Great, so far so good. Um, now if you look at the code for peak head, which is supposed to give you the first element in the list, right? So peak says um, head.get, so head.get that, let me maybe switch colors. Um, so head.get, which is this node, right? Head dot get dot next dot get so that is dot next 
dot get so this so uh, next here is this node which is indeed the next node uh, if next is null then return null that's fine next is not null then return next dot value so this is next dot value so peak will return that great that is indeed the first element of the list everything is fine um, okay no problem uh, similarly, if, if another in queue happens, notice that none of this touched anything past here. Oops, ooh, what did I do? What did I do? Uh, ooh, what on earth did I do? Uh, ah, I have done something weird. Uh, huh? Oh, that's because I have the eraser on. Uh, nothing in the peak touched past here. So if there are more in queues, it doesn't matter. Still does the right thing. Okay, uh, so now we look at conditionally remove head. So conditionally remove head or conditionally, oops, let's do a third color. So I guess this is peak. Uh, let's do, I guess, a orange type color. Um, so conditionally remove head. So conditional remove head takes a expected value and will only remove the head if that is its value. Okay, so it does head.get. So head.get is this guy. Then it does, uh, so this is, is cur head, right? Um, then it does next is cur head dot next dot get. So that again is this node. Uh, so that's gonna be next, great. Then it says if next is null, it's not, uh, or if next.value does not equal the expected value. So it compares, right, is this is v, it compares this v to this value, right? So it compares this v to this value, um, which is what we wanted it to, right? Like this is checking whether the head's value is equal to the provided argument. Great, so far so good. Um, if they are equal, then it won't return false. If they're unequal, it will. Um, so it'll go down to this line. Okay, and then it says if head dot compare and set, so head is this guy, dot compare and set current head to next. So current head to next. So it's saying head used to point to here, now stop pointing here and point to here instead. Right? That, that's what this line of code says. And then it modifies the current heads next uh, to be null. So it takes this node, right? Which is now disconnected and like removes this little arrow, um, which is so that this node can ulti ultimately be, uh, both so that this node can be deallocated and so that this next node might eventually be deallocated too. At least that's my read of it. Okay, but now we have a graph to sort of tidy this up a little bit. We now have a graph that is head points to um, this node whose next pointer is null um, and whose value is still what was in enc, right? If you, if you sort of ignore this node, which is the one that was just deleted, this is now the head of the list. But conditionally remove head was supposed to remove the head of the list whose value is the one we gave in, but that's not the one that was actually removed. What was removed was sort of the, the sentinel node that was here. And so in fact, if we now do a peak again, uh, new color, uh, purple, pink. So if we now do a peak here, right? Peak, remember, is gonna look at head dot next dot value okay head dot get next which is nothing so peak is going to return null but there is a thing with a value here so i guess peak does return the right thing after conditionally remove head so maybe this is why it works? Because even though it's messed up, like even though it leaves the node in place, peak ends up skipping it anyway? 
I mean, maybe it does work. It's just really strange, right? Because we did conditionally remove head of this value, but that value wasn't removed. It's just going to be skipped over by peak. I guess what happens now if we do an NQ? I guess the NQ will still work because it's going to operate on this node, which used to be the tail. <sighs> It's just really weird to me that the remove leaves the node with the value we said to remove in place as the head. It removes the node before the thing we told it to remove. It's just really weird. But now that I've seen like this peak does return null, so I guess maybe it's right? It If there was a node here, then peak would return that node? And if you do another conditionally remove head, It'll skip past the head, look at this node's value, and then remove this one. I guess it's just like always one node behind. This is really weird. I mean, it's, it seems to maybe do the right thing, which I guess means it's not wrong. Yeah, like next has made the new sentinel. That's weird. That's weird. But, oh, okay. F fine, I, I guess. So... Next is node.next.load. And then if next is... If next is null, then none else uh, unsafe next dot value that's a weird ass algorithm I'm not quite sure what it's complaining about here now all oh, right all right well we'll we'll try it uh, and then this is Uh, cur head is self dot head dot load. Um, and then next is cur head dot next dot load. This is a standard pattern, I suppose. Uh, if next is null or I'm going to go ahead and make this a little more explicit than return false. Uh, next is then going to be unsafe. Next. If next dot value is not equal to front, then return false. I'm just splitting this up because I kind of want... Oh, actually, I guess I don't use next for anything else. Um, but like the alternative is to have this read like unsafe next.value not equal to front. It just like looks a little less nice, but I suppose it's technically correct. Um, that's fine. And then I guess self dot head dot compare exchange cur head with next uh, ordering ordering uh, 
And this one, I think, uh, yeah, if it succeeds, then we do some stuff. If it errors, then we return false. And what we do on success is self.help finish ink. And then we do curhead.next.store pointer null. I think we probably don't need this extra store. Um, is this needed? Um, the reason I think we might not need the store is because uh, I think that's only there for like Java garbage collection. Oh no, it actually does need to be here. This is the way that we turn it back into a sentinel. Turn the... Or is that true? It's not clear actually why this is necessary. Because curhead isn't the sentinel. Next is the sentinel now. Next is the thing that we actually removed and is now the sentinel. Uh, not sure why setting that to null is necessary. It could be for garbage collection in Java, in which case we wouldn't need it in Rust, but I'm not sure. Um, okay, and we're gonna, ooh, it does not like this. Why does it not like this? Um, right, so we're gonna need this like help finish ink method, which we don't actually know what does yet, but that's fine. And curhead Yeah, it's a little frowned upon to, well, we'll just do this the old fashioned way. Uh, curhead is unsafe of curhead pointer. Uh, so now we have this and we can say, take the pointer please. Uh, this should return error. That's right, this should return okay. Uh, and this should return error. Uh, right, and we need to require that. I guess really this should be by. Well, one one question here is whether this value should be like a comparison by, like partial eek, or whether it should be by pointer. I feel like maybe it should actually be by pointer. Because we want to check whether uh, it's like whether it's the same t. It's not just whether they compare equal. Um, yeah, so I think we actually want. Um, sort of like. this why is the value an option t it's an option t because dot as ref uh oh it's we had to stick an option T there because for the sentinel node is not a T, which sort of means that the in this should really be an enum that it is either sentinel or node. Uh, but that probably gets annoying 
right around down here where we want to access fields like next anyway. So I think we're just gonna keep this be option T, that's fine. And then we'll just have to here do like uh, as ref expect, not a sentinel, sentinel node. No field value on mute node, that's false. I just made that be not the case. Um, and then same thing here, this should probably then be unsafe.value.asref.expect not a sentinel node. Because the only node that ever has a value of null is the original head node. Why is this complaining? Oh, that's why. Okay. And this collect is complaining because... Ooh, I wonder, can I just collect directly into an array? I don't think so. I think this does need to be a collect into a vec and then I'm pretty sure vec implements try into uh, for array. Concert, that's good. Convert try into, yeah, great. Uh, what do we not need? We don't need phantom data anymore. Great. Uh, right, and now we just need NQ and all the helpers, of course. Uh, so NQ is phase is self dot max phase plus one. Uh, and then self, self dot state ID um, and then this looks like it's just like a store of um, box into raw box new uh, op desk of something uh, where the phase is that pending is true, where NQ is true, and where node is new node of this, I guess, should be value of value and oops, of value and TID, which is ID. And this should be some. And this should be some. And ID should be I size. Feels wrong for ID to be I size here. Feels like uh, this should really just be Phase should be an option U64. U32 is probably fine, but U64. Let's not make this silly. Ink ID should be an option U size. Uh, so this should be an option U size. This is where it might be nice to make node an actual enum because otherwise you get into this business of like every field has to be an option. Um, but it just feels nicer to use an actual none here, uh, to use an actual none here, um, and to use a sum here. Really what we should do is say sentinel, which returns a self, and that is just gonna be 
value is none and ink ID is none. This should take an actual owned one of this and value should be sum of value and ink ID should be sum of ink ID. We want to, we don't want people to do this. I mean, this is only internal code anyway, but it just like feels wrong um, to have to pass in all these sums. Um, and then what does it do? Help and help finish ink. Okay, so it does self dot help finish ink and self dot help. Self help, nice. Um, and I guess we're gonna need whatever this uh, max face is, which I guess is like gonna be a U64. Maybe it's gonna end up being an option U64 because it might, the face might not be known. Um, and who knows what fn help is going to be, but I do know that it's going to take a phase, which is going to be a u64. Uh, and this is going to be a to do. And where did I mess up? Cannot add integer. So this is going to be an unwrap or. It's going to be a map of p plus that unwrap or oh it's actually even going to use the fancy map or what Ooh. right some face I can't spell anymore, which is a good indication that I've been programming for too long. Um, and this is going to take the phase that we chose. Right. And then, so it's really all the, the helper methods, which are going to move all down here. Whew. Could start numbering IDs at one, also true. It just like option is like the right thing to do here, I feel like. The, the other thing we could do, right, is we could, if we wanted, if we're worried about the overhead of the option, we could do like a option non-zero U size. Um, so I don't really want to unwrap options all over the place. Um, at the very least, it should be expect and you should document why the expect is accurate. Like none of these are unwraps. Um, like unwrap or is fine because it's not actually an unwrap. Um, but the places where you have to use expect like here is like really unfortunate. What I really want to do is encode it away so that this just can't happen. It's a little harder with concurrency because like given one of these, it's like you can't atomically change the variant of an enum. Right? So this is why we're sort of forced into this pattern of it has to be an option that we then always know has some value. Um, it's a little awkward. Maybe it could be union. Like we could manually implement a tagged union, but I don't know if it seem, it doesn't seem quite worth it. All right. Let's see if we can power through these uh, helper things. So we have, let's do max phase first. So max phase, I'm guessing there's like some construction here where like every, and it looks like this is the case, right? That every operation is given a phase. And when you help, you help everything in your phase, no matter which thread or in our case, which handle uh, instantiated that operation, but you had help all of the ones in that phase before you move on to the next one. Um, I don't know why that's necessary, but um, wait, this is a manually implemented max loop. We can do better than this, which is self dot state dot iter dot map s dot load uh, I guess unsafe s dot load no s dot load 
order ordering sequentially consistent. In fact, it doesn't even need to. This can just be an unsafe. That's fine. Uh, S dot load. Uh, dot phase dot max of course the problem here is that this returns an option so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a filter map great So that way, any um, any op desk that hasn't been given a phase yet is just going to be ignored. We're going to take the max. If all of them don't have one set yet, then max will be none as well. The iterator will be empty. Um, great. So that's max phase. That was easy. Is still pending. This seems like a helper method that we might as well just add straight away. Um, Fn is still pending, uh, takes a self, takes an ID, and takes a phase. I'm going to guess that that's what that is supposed to be, and returns a bool. And that's going to be Why does that not need to do a load? Oh, I see. That's just, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, it's just because we, it, I guess the, the atomic, what was it called? Like atomic array, atomic reference array in Java. I guess you can dot get a particular index and it's, it does both the indexing to find the right atomic pointer and the load in sort of one method. Uh, whereas for us, we have to index to get the atomic pointer and then do the load. Um, they're, they're equivalent in terms of like what it actually computes to, but that's fine. Um, but why does it do the, why does it do two loads? That seems, that seems bad. Just like, like it, it's doing the load twice, which seems problematic. Like the, the Java code does an atomic load here and then another atomic load here, which even if it's not wrong, seems kind of wasteful. Uh, unwrap or zero because less than or equal the java code uses minus one for which this will always be true and for us none will be turned into zero for which the condition is true because it's less than or equal great so we now have this still pending and i guess we can move these down so that they're in the same places in the java code All right, so now we have the help functions left. Let's do help finish ink. Um, so help finish ink. Last is self dot tail dot load. Next is, am I going to have to do anything with last? This is last pointer. And again, for all of these, the safety is we don't deallocate. Like this is why it, I kind of consider doing hazard pointers as a second stream because ultimately there's going to be so much unsafe here that really just is we need memory reclamation. Um, and ultimately that 
that shouldn't even need to be unsafe, I don't think. Um, the hope is that the hazard pointer library that we end up writing takes care of the unsafety around um, whether things are safe to, to dereference. Or rather, ensuring that they always are safe to dereference. So this is next pointer. Um, so there's like a if it's not equal to null, then indent this whole block, and we're just going to do if it is null, then return um, because that seems nicer. Um, so now we're going to do let ID is, or I guess that next is unsafe next pointer. Um, next dot ink ID. Um, and I think here we, uh, next is never the sentinel. So we know that this ink ID must be set. It must be some. Um, and then we get, I guess, curdesk is state dot get of ID, which is really state ID dot load. So this is pointer. The reason I'm splitting pointer and not pointer here is because. Um, sometimes we'll want to uh, refer specifically to the pointer even after we've dereferenced it. Uh, this matters things like compare and swap where you actually need to give the raw pointer argument rather than the, the, the reference that we end up producing. The other reason is because that way I can easily mark just the dereference as being unsafe rather than marking like the indexing as being unsafe as well if I put an unsafe around this whole thing. Um, all right, so if last pointer is equal to why does it load the tail again here? If the last pointer is still the same and So this is also weird. Like, why does it do another load of this here after reading the tail again? It's annoying because this one might actually be important. It might be important that you do this read after you do this read. Um, but it's not entirely clear from the way that it's currently set up. Uh, like, this could be curdesk dot node, but instead each of these is a separate load, which is a little worrying. I'm like, is it intentional that each of these is a separate separate load of the state, maybe, but also maybe not. Here too, we can like invert it to avoid the indentation. Or cur dot. Well, what does this, I want to try to understand what this code actually does. So it like, okay, first of all, let's get proper indentation by not having the Java code in here. Um, so what does this actually do? It looks at the tail pointer. It looks at what comes after the tail pointer. 
Oh, I see what's going on. So, okay, the name is pretty indicative, right? Help finish NQ. So I think the idea is that the actual NQ is probably just um, is probably just setting the next pointer of whatever the tail is. But then something has to update the tail pointer as well. And that's what this help finish ink is, is updating the tail pointer. So if, if the tail pointer, if the, okay, so the tail points somewhere. If the next of that node is null, then the tail pointer is already correct and there's nothing to help. So this is uh, tail pointer is already correct. So nothing to do already. Let's go with up to date. Um, so then it need, then it reads, what is the next pointer? Um, looks up the current operation of the thread that enqueued the thing that is after where the tail pointer is pointing. Right, so the, the tail pointer point to something that isn't the tail. So we look at the next of that node, and then we look at what is the thread that enqueued that next doing. That's what curdesk is. Um, and if the last pointer has already been updated, so I guess this can be like, just to make it very clear, uh, a lot, uh, Tail pointer has already been updated. Um, and then this is if this is if the owner of the next node is now working on a subsequent operation, uh, the NQ must have finished. Uh, oh, I'll fix that in a second. Right, so the, the observation here is that if the tail has already been updated, we're done. This is, um, we're looking up the basically the current operational state of the the node that added the thing after the tail. Um, if that node is currently working on something that isn't the next node, then its NQ must have completed for it to do something else instead, which means that its call to help finish NQ must have completed, which means that it must it uh, the tail must be up to date. I think I think that's what it's going for here. Um, curdesk.node. I think this curdesk.node is actually just a raw pointer, maybe. Like, maybe this shouldn't be a node. I think this has to be a star mute node T. Because this is sort of like, this is the pointer I'm trying to put into the, the data structure, um, which is, is gonna be a, a, a raw pointer because we've already turned it into a raw pointer. We don't really have a node. Nodes are ever only ever represented it as raw pointers. Um, so I think this is going to be like box into raw bo box new. In fact, I think node new should return a star mute to self, honestly. Uh this is an option 
Why is it an option? It's an option because of the Sentinel, because initially Opdesk won't be modifying a node. Um, and so what happens if that's the case? Uh, the next pointer I see so this really should be like Curtis dot no dot unwrap or standard pointer null. Unwrap or else. Right, like if node is none, I don't think we can get here if node is none, but if node is none, then that's equivalent to it to being a null pointer that we want to compare because that was that's what it was in the Java code. Um, great. So now we sort of want a new desk is box into uh, actually yeah box into raw box new op desk uh, phase is gonna be see this is another place where like presumably the phase isn't changing just because we made progress on the in queue. Nothing changes the face. There's no increment to the face except by the owning thread. It's like this is uh, uh, uh. But yeah, I guess you see like now the operation is no longer pending because it completed. Um, and this is now some next pointer. But isn't that, we're already comparing whether node is equal to next. So this is just the same as it was. Like this is, this is just curdesk.next. Otherwise we wouldn't, we wouldn't get in here in the first place. Uh, dot node. Because this comparison checks that they are the same. Uh, so really, this is just setting pending to false, which feels like it shouldn't be necessary to allocate a new. This is really just setting pending equals false. It shouldn't need full RCU, but um, and then it does state dot compare and set so this is self dot state of id dot compare exchange uh cur desk pointer with i guess this is going to be new desk pointer like this sort of feels like it could maybe just be an atomic bool I feel like this could be an atomic pool that we just updated, but uh, self.tail.compare com exchange. Uh, last pointer to next pointer. Ordering sec, ordering relaxed. And it doesn't even check whether these succeed or failed, which is kind of interesting. It just like does this. I really feel like that could just be an atomic pool. But let's not mess with the uh, the algorithm too much. Um, 
Okay, so I think that only leaves help. Um, so there's help and there's help ink. So I guess let's do help ink. It's FN help ink. Uh, ID is U size and face is U64. Why, uh, and it, oh, it's on self. While self dot is still pending. That last pointer. Uh, and next pointer. I guess this is really just the same as what we did here. Um, right? Uh huh. And if if last is equal to see, I see. So it has to. Uh, tail was concurrently updated. This just seems like a huge waste, right? Like here, uh, you, you read the updated pointer. So why not use that the second time around the loop? Like we're reading, reading the tail pointer. Then we're reading its next pointer. Then we're reading the tail pointer again to see that it didn't change. Okay. That's reasonable. So you, you want to make sure that. Um, you actually got the next pointer you got actually corresponds to that tail. So that's fine. But now the next time around the loop, you could say, save yourself a load. But let's just leave it the way it is for now. Um, that's fine. Uh, if next pointer is null, then do something. Otherwise, self dot help finish ink. So this is tail is not up to date. Help make it help update it. Uh, and this is a continue. Okay. Um, and then here, this is next pointer is null. So this is if self, and then it calls it pending again. Um, phase is already over. So in that case, we can continue. But I'm guessing that if the phase is over, Like if if the phase is over, then it's gonna remain over. I would think. So I think this can just be a return. I mean, it's just gonna end up checking twice, which is fine. But I guess like to do, can this just return? Um. So notice that instead of doing this indentation, I'm just like inverting all the conditions and returning early. I find it le leads to slightly easier to read code, um, but each to their own. Um, if last dot next compare exchange next pointer uh, node is self dot state ID load. There's like a, this is a very involved protocol. And like, I'm not explaining why it's safe because I don't necessarily know, like weight free algorithms are super complicated. Um, so I'm sort of just sort of taking this on blind faith that the implementation that's provided is like correct. Um, so this is going to be like cur desk. Um, pointer her desk is unsafely dereference that 
uh, compare exchange to this with curdesk.node. Um, and I guess this will be an unwrap or else pointer null mute. Uh, oh, this Java code needs to be in a comment because otherwise I can't see what I'm typing. Um, I see, so this is like, if that is okay, then help finish in queue and return is what the Java code says. Right, so this is um, so what is this doing? This is helping in queue a thing. So while the phase is still pending, so this means there's still some operations that some threads have to complete in this phase. Um, then try to make sure that we know what the tail is, like the tail. Where this is basically us checking that we have a tail and a next pointer for that tail that we know are like both up to date. That's what this is doing up to here. So here we know we have a uh, valid tail tail dot next pair, uh, a consistent if you will, a pair um, and that it needs it uh, likely still needs to be updated. So let's try to actually execute the NQ. Um, right, that, that's where we're at here. Um, and we do that by looking up the, the NQ from the NQing threads uh, descriptor. the to be enqueued node from the enqueuing threads descriptor, right? So we look up the the descriptor for the enqueue operation for that thread, uh, and then we try to update the tail the tail pointers or the the last node's next pointer to point to the node that is to be inserted. Um, and in fact, I think this can even just be an expect. Uh, uh, pending and queues are always, uh, it's funny. This doesn't actually check. Does this check whether this is pending? Like something has to check that we're actually trying to help something that is an in queue. Oh, that's up here. Yeah. Okay. Great. So this is like. Uh, no, I'm actually going ahead and gonna go ahead and leave this as this because um, this would only be safe to unwrap if we know here that the or which we really should. Okay, fine, 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 fine. Ah, so here, oh, where did I jump to? Here, um, this should be an expect. Um, node should always be sum for pending pending uh, and q um, and so here we should really do like an uh, an assert uh, we can have it be a debug assert that's fine assert uh, that this is indeed a pending operation and that this is uh, an enqueue operation. And in fact, if it's if this operation is not pending, then why are we still executing it? Is the other thing I want to find out. Like if like if this is not pending to do can we Continue. Feels like we can. Can we a 
assert this isn't this is still pending like it feels like we probably can assert something about this um we should certainly debug assert that this is indeed an enqueue operation because you shouldn't be calling help enqueue if that thread doesn't have an enqueue operation anymore. Um, I feel like we can probably assert here that it is still pending, but I'm not, I'm not confident enough to make that an assertion. Um, this needs to be ID. And then I guess help is all that's left. And um, what's nice is that we should be able to write a um, a unit or unit test specifically for the help queue. Like this is definitely something that I want us to write because this is like really gnarly code. And even just for the single threaded variant, like it doesn't need to concurrency even. I just want to see that we wrote code that was correct. Um, of course. It's going to leak all sorts of memory, but that's fine as long as we check that the logic is actually correct. Um, this is for i in fact, it doesn't even need that. It's just for uh, this is for descriptor in self dot state. Pointer it uh, is desk dot load I mean this is not this is like the desk atomic <laughs> uh, and then this is the ooh that's not what I meant to do um this is the desk pointer. This is the desk. Uh, the desk pointer. And then if desk dot pending and desk dot face is less than equal to face. And then there's an additional if, which could sort of be collapsed. Um, this, but really what this means is this uh, operation needs help. Um, and then if desk.nq, which is currently the only helpable operation is nq, right? So this feels like it could probably be simplified a decent amount. My guess is what they did was they started with a wait-free implementation that supported other operations, but then they sort of stripped it down to only the things they needed for the wait-free simulation stuff, which is basically like you need peak, try remove front, and and queue. Um, and as long as you have those three, like probably a bunch of the other operations just went away. And so therefore here they probably used to be like if desk dot delete or something, right? Then help in some other way. But in this way, in this case, there are only in queue operations to help, and so you just that's just the only one that's left. Um, why does help bank take I? Oh, I see. So this is self dot state dot error dot enumerate taking ID and this, and this takes ID. Um, it's a little stupid here too, because uh, unwrap or because the other thing that having this be an array does is that you actually need to iterate through all of the um, you need to iterate all it, through all of the threads every time you want to help not just like this isn't a vector it's a it's an array. Um, and so you can't like skip to the first one that needs help. You have to iterate through all of them. So this is like linear in N. So if someone tries to go like, oh, let's just make this 1,024 threads or something, uh, like support for 1,024 handles, then this code is going to iterate through 1,024 things, even if you only have like two handles, um, which seems maybe unfortunate. Um, 
But, you know, maybe we should document that somewhere. Uh, operations are linear in N. So be careful. Mm, it doesn't compile because 74. Uh, that's not right. I think what we're actually going to do here is be I see what's going on. The way we're going to use this help queue is actually even, it's going to store pointers. Um, so like when we return a reference to T here, it's going to be like a reference to a pointer. I think we're actually going to do we're gonna have this be T, have this be T, and just say where T is copy and partial eek and eek. And then now this is no longer that. Um, Now what? That's fine. That can just now be an expect. Where's the other place I used as ref? Because this is copy, this can now just be that. So that's nice. Ooh, only warnings? No, something's wrong. Oh. Private type. Oh right, because we made um, we made this be a type alias, which means that this type now actually is the one we're really using, which means it also needs to be pub crate, which is a little dumb, but it means that we get to. Um, it means we don't have to implement all like these forwarding functions here, which is a little unnecessary. It also means I can get rid of this. Um, and here we specifically don't care about the result of this compare exchange, which like is a little weird, but I feel like maybe we like can, should we assert on these? I think the answer is no. I think the answer is that if they fail, we're just going to continue helping anyway. Um, so I think we're just going to not do that. Um, unused import, that's good. That makes me happy. Uh, and the deck ID was probably there just for debugging, uh, which means we can do this and config test and just ignore it entirely. And in fact, I'm just going to go ahead and remove that because it just complicates the code unnecessarily. And now we don't need atomic eye size, and that makes me happy. And it compiles. <sighs> oh, all right. Uh, why does the unsafe block on desk DRF only l last one line? Shouldn't it last for the whole function? The unsafe block on desk. It's done in help. Uh, what unsafe block? I'm not sure I follow. Oh yeah, so so all of these unsafes are like because we never deallocate is the answer. Why all of the unsafes are safe. Um, 
Oh, I see. So, uh, what were what this? So the question is slightly different. The question is, why is it okay for this unsafe to end here? I, th I think this is a question. Why is it okay for the unsafe to end here when the reference that we got out of it, we keep using until the end of the block? Shouldn't that mean that the unsafe block also needs to extend to here? And the answer is no. The answer is because unsafe in Rust is an encapsulating operation. If you, or annotation rather, when you annotate something as unsafe, you are promising that what you are doing in that instance is safe. So in our case, this unsafe is promising that taking this raw pointer and constructing a reference to it with the returned lifetime is safe. So what we're saying here is, first of all, this is a valid pointer. It's aligned and it's not null and whatnot. And we're also claiming by writing unsafe here that the lifetime of that pointer is going, or that rather, that pointer is going to continue to be valid for as long as this desk lives. Basically, think of this as like this: uh, this unsafe is really um, is really like turning a star cons t or whatever right into a tick a t, and so the unsafe promise that we're making is that it the this pointer really is valid for tick A. Um, and that tick A here is until the end of the scope. Um, okay, we're at the five and a bit mark. So I think we're probably going to end here. Um, at least now we have what in theory is a complete implementation. We have the wait-free queue, we have all of the simulation stuff. And so what's left now is testing, obviously. Um, in particular, I want to test the, the help queue because like that's some super gnarly low-level code. Um, but we need to like write a data structure that uses this as well uh, and then test the overall, overall simulation. Um, and then separately, we now have all these issues around memory reclamation, right? Like all the stuff that's currently unsafe is only safe because we never deallocate and that's not good enough. Um, we need to deallocate memory. Um, and in order to do that, we need to implement something like hazard pointers or now that we have, now that we're sort of forced to have this uh, where did it go? Where did it go? Now that we ha we're forced to have this like handle approach where it's not just like you can share a single weight free simulator. You need to like fork it for each thread that needs it. Um, now that we have that, um, it might be that we can just go with like uh, crossbeam epic or something that, that already has a guard primitive that we might be able to use for the memory reclamation here. Um, I'm not quite decided either way. I kind of want to port the hazard pointer stuff anyway, because hazard pointers are cool and neat in their own way. Um, but that's all, that's like an obvious shortcoming of this implementation now too. Um, so I think from here, there's sort of a, a branching point where we could either go the, let's just test it and not worry about memory reclamation now, or we could go the, let's fix memory reclamation and then test it. Um, I'll see which one I feel more like. Uh, my guess is the next stream will be in like three weeks. Roughly been doing like a three week schedule lately uh, and I'll, I'll try to sort of stick to that. Um, so yeah, I think, I think now that it all compiles and we have code, I don't think we have any like big to do's now. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. I don't think we have any actual like to do macros. So I think we wrote all the code or we wrote a first try at all the code at least. Um, so I think I'm happy to, to sort of end it off there. Before I do though, are there any questions about what we did today? I know that's a the large, quest, large question, but like things where you're still like, I'm a little fuzzy on how this piece fit into what we did, what we did with like the handles, like anything I can 
clear up so that you don't have lingering questions until like three weeks from now or six points from now or something. Um, so about the tail end. Uh, what would point in favor of testing last? Would be good to see whether it actually works before memory reclamation gets implemented. Um, so my concern with testing first is that the code may end up having to be re-architected a bit to do memory reclamation. So the testing that we do may not buy us that much confidence. Um, that said, like if we run the tests and they all pass, that's great. Uh, that That's obviously a big sort of um, point of value. But my concern is we add memory reclamation, a bunch of the code ends up shifting around. So even if the tests pass, that doesn't give us any indication of whether the new implementation is correct. Uh, so we may end up having to like redo most of the test. I don't, I don't think that'll be true, um, but I think these are really fairly orthogonal. Like implementing memory reclamation is just, like the first stream on memory reclamation will be a new library that just exposes memory reclamation. And then there'll sort of be a third stream that brings that into what we've done here. So what, what we might do, right, is implement hazard pointers just for a for a like brush of fresh brush of fresh air, actually. Uh, breath of fresh air. Um, and then do like a then do a stream of writing tests for the non-memory reclaimed one and then do one that we bring it together. Um, uh, does the wait-free queue require a wait-free queue to be considered wait-free? How does contention get resolved for this queue? So this queue that we just wrote is itself wait-free. Uh, this queue. It is itself wait. It's wait-free. There's no inner queue in this one as well. The simulation we wrote depends on a wait-free queue. But this wait-free queue is sort of wait-free in and of itself. Um, and if there's contention, basically what happens here is that every enqueue operation, so every every peak, right, is obviously wait free. There's no nothing that waits in here. Every try remove front um, never waits. It does call help finish, but help finish is guaranteed to make progress. So and in a in a finite number of steps, so it's wait free. The the complicated one is enqueue, and what makes NQ wait free is that it always just immediately stores that it wants help and then it tries to help everyone in its phase. So if I NQ, I must help others that are stuck before me in order for my thing to make progress. And therefore everything makes progress in these phases. Um, all right. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll push this code to GitHub as well and include that in the... Um, in the video description where I ultimately upload it um, so that the, you have a place to actually see it. Uh, yeah, there's there's still some way to go. Um, my guess is another two or three streams. Right? I'm imagining that porting hazard pointers is a stream in and of itself to a library. Maybe two, probably one, a little bit hard to say. Um, uh, it's hard to say, but let's say it's one. Um, testing this is like half a stream. It depends how many problems we find. Half a stream. Moving all of the code to use hazard pointers or whatever the memory reclamation scheme is about a stream. So it's like two and a half streams left is my, my rough guess here. Um, uh, if getting a fork is not weight free, why does it not affect the weight freedness of the queue? Uh, it's a good question. So um, the idea here is that every thread is gonna have its own handle. So once all the threads have handles, all operations are weight-free. Getting a handle is not weight-free. And the two are, it's important to keep them distinct because in general, 
getting a handle is something you'll do very early on. Like you'll just, like it's sort of set up almost, it is initialization. But in the main running of your code, you won't be forking. Like you fork is like, you won't be forking the process, but you won't be forking your handles either. You won't be cloning the handles all, the, all over the place. At least you shouldn't be. Um. Oh yeah, so sorry, when I say testing is half a stream, I meant testing of the wait-free queue. Testing the whole thing, um, I don't think we should, we should probably not do until the memory reclamation is in place too, for the reasons I outlined earlier. Um, so I think realistically, it's like three streams until we're done. All right, thank you all for coming out. Uh, I hope this was interesting and I'll uh, see you again in like three-ish weeks. Uh, and I'll let you know a little bit in advance whether we do hazard pointers or more of this. So long, farewell. Auf Wiedersehen. Goodbye. Ah, no, that's not what I want to do. I want to do.